Greetings, and welcome to our three-hour lore compilation on Emperor Darth Sidious. If you've seen our last compilation on the ultimate Sith Lord and Emperor of the Galactic Empire, rest assured this is all entirely brand new content and is Darth Sidious lore that we have pined and searched for over the last year. So without further ado, sit back and enjoy, for now we discuss the Emperor. Darth Sidious has been on record as stating that he believes that the Sith have grown past the use of a lightsaber, and that he only wields one to simply mock the Jedi that pride them so deeply. Darth Sidious' force feats need no introduction or explanation. However, with him, somebody that has this opinion of the lightsaber and lightsaber combat to be as deadly and proficient as he is, a master of killing and a master of the blade, does require a deep in-depth explanation. And today, acolytes of the Force and students of the galaxy, let us open up another holocron, take a look at Darth Sidious's mindset during a duel and his training under his master Darth Plagueis, and break down exactly why Darth Sidious was such a deadly and proficient lightsaber duelist, so skilled in an art that he in reality cared very little for. It is in the Darth Plagueis novel where there are a few very brief lines where Plagueis explains to Sidious the importance of lightsaber combat. Plagueis looks at his apprentice as he is drilling with the blade and says, as this. Your reactions must be instantaneous and nothing less than lethal, for you are a Sith Lord and have been marked for death. Darth Sidious is one of the most skilled people to ever touch the lightsaber. He absolutely embarrassed three Jedi Masters and went toe-to-toe -to -toe with Mace Windu and Grandmaster Yoda. Grandmaster Yoda, who he appeared to stalemate, and Mace Windu, depending on who you ask, may have actually deceived. With that said, it's incredible that Darth Sidious, a master with the blade, would later go on to tell Vader that he only used a lightsaber to mock the Jedi, was so insanely skilled, so much in fact that he butchered and dismantled Savage Press as well as handily defeated Maul. What's incredible about Darth Sidious's lightsaber skill and ascension to a point of power is the fact that he had very limited training partners as a young Sith apprentice. In fact, one of the only partners he had would have been his master in Plagueis. And unfortunately for us in the lore, we have very little of Darth Plagueis, other than a few lines in his book and comments from Ten that states that Darth Plagueis is indeed a master of all seven forms of lightsaber combat, a comment that he would also give to his own apprentice Insidious, stating that he too was a master of all seven forms. I think the most answers that we'll end up finding about Darth Sidious's training will have to do with his own training methods with individuals such as Maul. Unlike his later apprentices in Dooku and Vader, Maul was an uncrafted opponent and an uncrafted lightsaber wielder, so how exactly did Darth Sidious train Maul? And is this indicative of how Sidious himself was trained. One of Sidious's favorite things to do with Maul was to actually put him up against some of the most highly advanced droids that the galaxy had to offer, not to mention doing so in isolated places, leading us to infer that this is also something that Sidious likely endured himself. Even later on, it was revealed that Darth Vader himself would duel against droids, only this time he would duel against droids that he had a specific hand in creating, having implanted within them various forms of lightsaber combat that would change and adapt on the fly, similar to the likes of Grievous, and Vader did so in order to hone his craft specifically on how to take out Jedi that he was hunting at the time. It is here where we see a key difference between the Jedi and the Sith. While the Jedi most of the time practice against their masters, or other young initiates or padawans, the Sith have no other choice. They are forced to either duel their masters specifically, or go against combat droids. But, make no mistake, the Sith do put just as much of an emphasis on lightsaber combat as the Jedi do. We are aware that the Sith utilizing droids during the Rule of Two era for their training was not a new thing, and that nearly every single one of them did utilize a droid of some time to hone their skill in lightsaber combat us obviously to infer that also Darth Sidious participated in this common practice. But with that addressed, there is one individual that plays a much more crucial role in the training of Sidious than any droid ever could. We have to look at his master in Plagueis. What's unique about Darth Plagueis is he has been on record as stating that he doesn't particularly enjoy lightsaber duels nor lightsaber combat, and it is this belief within Darth Plagueis that also leads to Sidious's belief that they have grown beyond lightsabers. However, this is not to say that Darth Plagueis was not a formidable duelist at all. In fact, he was quite formidable. As stated earlier, Darth Tenebris, Plagueis' own master, stated that Plagueis had now officially completed all seven forms of lightsaber combat, and even so, 
mastered all of them to near perfection. Beyond this, unlike Plagueis, it is heavily known that Darth Tenebris loved lightsaber combat and was highly proficient at it. But what about Darth Plagueis' specific feats? Well, one of the only major lightsaber encounters that Plagueis was involved in is actually one that is highly impressive. Underneath his nose, Darth Tenebris, his own master, trained another apprentice, another Bith, by the name of Darth Venomous. Venomous was specifically trained to take out Plagueis, someone who Tenebris, Plagueis' own master, secretly loathed. Unfortunately for us, the Darth Plagueis novel does not detail a ton of training about Darth Sidious. However, it does detail three specific events that shaped Sidious as a dark side wielder, as well as specifically a lightsaber wielder. Darth Plagueis realized the importance of Sidious in himself as the culmination of the Rule of Two. These two Sith Lords had a different mindset from the Sith that predated them. They were aware and ready to fulfill the prophecy of the Rule of Two and seize the galaxy, and Plagueis knew that he needed to prepare Sidious. The first of these three major trials occurred as a sort of hunt. During the hunt, the Sith Lords were only armed with vibroblades, not lightsabers, but this was meant to give them a distinct disadvantage. The hunt occurred on the planet known as Buoyant, whose atmosphere had been terraformed decades earlier. What resulted was a planet spinning more rapidly than is normal. What this did was cause two very specific things that Plagueis had in mind. The animals were far faster than is normal for the Star Wars galaxy, and their movements were more unpredictable the exact things that Plagueis wanted to shape in Sidious. Darth Plagueis referred to this act as a summoning, and that leads us to another thing. The dark side of the Force and lightsaber combat go hand in hand perfectly. As Darth Bane and Revan explained, lightsaber combat was actually more linked to the dark side of the Force than the Jedi ever realized. They could use the dark side of the Force to literally fuel their blade, making them faster, making their movements more precise and more deadly. And this is the exact mindset that Plagueis needed to instill in Darth Sidious, and one of the major advantages that Sidious has in a duel against the Jedi. He is using the full might of the dark side of the Force, as perhaps one of the most perfect avatars of the dark side, to fuel his every movement, with that being the purpose of this exercise given to him by Plagueis. Through this, not only was Sidious looking for the dark side, but he also became massively attractive to the dark side itself. For Darth Sidious' second trial, the droids played another major role as Higo Damask or Darth Plagueis ordered 200 battle droids to be delivered to a desolate world. This next test would occur on the world of Hypori. For this next lesson imparted on Sidious, this would be about defense, forcing the Dark Lord of the Sith, who typically give to aggression and anger and fuel their blade too offensively to learn defense. Facing 200 battle droids as a sole man, Darth Sidious was forced to fall back onto Form 3 Sirisu and more defensive maneuvers of the blade. Not to mention that that the sheer number of battle droids meant that every move that Sidious made had to be flawless and near perfect taking out as many droids as he could in quick succession. And the final test for Darth Sidious would occur on the world known as Cursed. Cursed was a world at many centuries before the fall of the Republic. The location of it was deleted from all Jedi and Republic records, and starting in the year 654 BBY, it was frequently visited by members of the Sith Order. On the occasions of their visits, the Sith sought battle with the Cursed natives in an arid plateau on part of the planet where they had landed, and engaged large numbers of them in combat in order to hone their skills. Despite the hostile intentions of the Sith, a cult centered around this periodic returns of the Sky Visitors eventually developed as a part of the culture, and the natives of the world of Cursed had prepared for centuries to battle every generation of Sith. This was Sidious's final test, to destroy a people whose only goal was to destroy the Sith themselves in a ritualistic combat. The same location where Darth Plagueis was deemed worthy by Darth Tenebra, so too would Sidious. And Sidious did so brilliantly, taking out wave after wave of enemy. The strongest, most fit, terrifying natives of the world all fell to the blade of Darth Sidious and the Sith. And with that, when Darth Plagueis states that Sidious is a true master of the blade, he is correct. And with all of this, it makes sense why Sidious would not be able to only compete with the greatest swordsmen of the Jedi, but in many cases, more than once, outright embarrass them. And this is why Darth Sidious is truly one of the most formidable and skilled lightsaber wielders in all of the lore. 
but greetings, curious acolytes of the Force, and welcome back to the Archives. Darth Plagueis was known as a Sith that had orchestrated the power over life and death. His legendary ability to manipulate the midichlorians was what was cemented him as one of the most powerful Sith in the entire Order's history. Whenever Palpatine is explaining the tragic tale of Darth Plagueis the Wise to Anakin in the Opera House, we can see on his face the satisfaction that he took in the ending of his master's life. As he speaks the words, ironic, he could save others from death, but not himself. You can literally see the immense pleasure and almost amusement that Sidious feels even to this very day. It's ironic. He could save others from death. But not himself. At this point in time, it had nearly been 12 years since the day that he killed Darth Plagueis, and he still looked upon it with great pride. What is interesting to many though, is how exactly did Sidious manage to kill someone who had essentially figured out the secret to life and death? If Plagueis was truly able to control the very aspect of nature, and was so powerful that Sidious waited until he was asleep to make his move, why couldn't he have defended himself? What exactly caused the death of Darth Plagueis? Well my friends, for those of you who haven't read the Darth Plagueis novel, this video is for you. For Plagueis was extremely powerful in the Force, and although he ultimately detested combat, he was quite adept at it, and no one who he faced in battle could ever seem to stand a chance against him. And Darth Plagueis was very much an underrated combatant. His powers and knowledge in the Force was far beyond what a good many Sith had achieved in their own lifetime, even those that focused on combat. However, he kept all of this under wraps and decidedly used his charismatic power as a political figure, an entrepreneur, to secure his grip on the galaxy and his hidden network of power. Now obviously, being in any sort of a political sphere will earn you rivals, especially when concerning galactic politics. Business and politics were a battleground just as ruthless as that on the front lines of war and in both cases, people can be killed. Plague has earned a rich repertoire of people who wanted him killed, and although there have been several attempts made on Plagueis's life, none were ever successful, except for the one that nearly was. And no, we aren't talking about Sidious. This was many, many years prior to Sidious's betrayal, when Higo Damask, aka Plagueis, was still very much in the public eye, and was currently doing all of his own dealings. A near fatal mistake. It would happen when Higo Damask was a part of a secret ceremony that was being held by the important political figures of the galaxy. It was a sort of underground society of all of the most important people, and Damask, as well as one other, Larsh Hill, were being initiated into the fraternity. When the initiation was over, however, one of the members literally decapitated Larsh Hill, and the rest of the members present threw off of their cloaks to reveal themselves as Maladian assassins. Now, the Maladian assassins were no joke. Maladians were a cult of highly skilled humanoid assassins from the Maladi system, known to honor all of their contracts, and they have just killed the other person in the room with Higo Damask, Darth Plagueis. The Maladian assassins were also familiar with the Akachi martial arts, which were created to counter the effects of force wielders. The assassins threw razor discs at the rest of the people in the room, decapitating them all instantaneously, despite being a Dark Lord of the Sith. The sudden razor disc attack indeed caught Darth Plagueis himself off guard, and although he managed to avoid being decapitated, the disc managed to inflict a terrible wound on Plagueis. The disc flew at him and cleanly sliced off a considerable amount of his lower half of his face, as well as his trachea. However, Plagueis would not go down without a fight. Revealing himself and using the force, he kept the wound closed while lashing out with the dark side and sending many of the assassins to their grave. However, his heavy injuries impeded a lot of his ability to use the Force at the time. Otherwise, he would have made short work of the assassins. Eventually, Palpatine would arrive and rescue his master before getting him medical attention. Following this, the Sith would take revenge, as Sidious himself would personally see to the man who ordered the attack. However, the damage was done and this was decades before Plagueis would have perfected the manipulation of midichlorians and the ability to prevent death. Darth Plagueis was forced to wear a respirator mask for the rest of his life, and by the time he mastered his abilities, the damage was permanent 
This was the real secret to Plagueis' demise. Now, fast forwarding to the fateful night that Palpatine's suite and the death of Darth Plagueis. Both Sith Lords were celebrating their victory at Palpatine having won the Chancellorship election. They drank quite a bit of wine, and Palpatine incessantly continued to recite his acceptance speech until Plagueis was put to sleep. An interesting thing to note here, Palpatine had actually grabbed his cloak and was about to leave, allowing his master to just sleep on the sofa in peace. However, the dark side called to Darth Sidious right as he was at the door, and it whispered to him that the time was now. Darth Sidious then stood over his master in slumber, and immediately began to fry the respirator that he needed to continue breathing with force lightning. Plagueis did attempt to fight back against his apprentice, but Palpatine was too fast and kept sending wave after wave of force lightning at Darth Plagueis, and because Plagueis couldn't even catch a breath of his own. There was no way he could gather the force as he very quickly was dying, and he needed the force instantly, something that Darth Sidious would not allow. Manipulating the midichlorians was something that still required a lot of focus, and at the current moment, his focus was on trying to keep himself from dying. However, it was all for naught, as Sidious simply let out all of his hatred in one final speech, before choking the life out of his master once and for all and thus the end of Darth Plagueis came. This is what truly ended the life of Plagueis the Wise, an assassination attempt gone sideways, and his apprentice taking full advantage of this one weakness that Plagueis had. Well, destroy the Sith, we must, but apparently not together. Greetings, Acolytes of the Force, and welcome back to the Archives. In Revenge of the Sith, Obi-Wan Kenobi and Master Yoda traversed the Jedi Temple in search of what had happened there. They were forced to step over piles of dead Jedi bodies, even those of younglings, all killed by either clone or lightsaber. Upon reviewing the security tapes, Obi-Wan learns the truth of what had actually happened here. The boy he had trained since childhood had embraced the dark side and brought ruin upon the entire Jedi Order as they knew it, and all at the behest of the mysterious Dark Lord of the Sith, Darth Sidious. There was only one thing left to do for these two Jedi Masters, fulfill their duty and destroy the Sith at all costs. Obi-Wan is apprehensive and begs Yoda to send him after the Emperor instead. But the Grand Master simply tells him that Obi-Wan is not strong enough to face him, and that Obi-Wan must confront his brother. But wait, why is this the only option here? Why did Yoda say that Obi-Wan wasn't strong enough instead of them going after Sidious together as a team? Their splitting up and trying to divide and conquer instead of going after the Dark Lord is one of the likely decisions that cost them the galaxy. The question we desire to answer today though, is why did Yoda refuse to team up with Obi-Wan in order to take down Sidious? And if they had gone together, what would have happened? Well, there's only one way to find out, so let's open up another holocron and get into it. There are in fact three major reasons why the Jedi decided to divide and take on each Sith Lord one on one. The first thing that we have to acknowledge is that the Emperor had moved very quickly, so quickly in fact, that it made the galaxy and the Jedi's head spin. For so long, the Sith had remained in the shadows, not making many moves at all, and certainly biding their time. But suddenly, in the span of a single evening, the plans of the Sith came to fruition, and the entire Jedi Order was obliterated. Order 66 had happened in a single blitzkrieg. While Obi-Wan's ears were still ringing from the cannon fire shot at him at Utapau, Jedi from across the galaxy were falling in heaps. At this exact same moment, Anakin had carried out Operation Nightfall, and not even the Jedi Temple was a safe haven any longer. Yoda had felt this moment in a colossal wave of a disturbance in the Force, the likes of which he had likely never once felt in his 878 years of existence. In an instant, the very balance of the Force had been tipped so dramatically that the dark side was now covering the entire galaxy, covering it in one large shadow, a shadow that indicated the end of the Jedi. It was now up to the few Jedi that remained in Obi-Wan and Yoda to finish what had been started thousands of years before and destroy the Sith. Unfortunately though, there was no longer time to forge the perfect plot. There was no backup plan. There was no one coming to the rescue of them. No more reinforcements, no ace in the hole, and as far as the two Jedi were concerned, 
almost no hope. Their only course of action was to respond as quickly as the Sith had acted, which meant taking out two Dark Lords in one fell swoop, a response to the immediate action taken by Sidious. They could not possibly risk the chance that if they engaged Sidious and he recalled Vader back to Coruscant that the two of them would be caught between the two most powerful men in the known galaxy. Yoda and Obi-Wan had a much better chance at taking the two of them separately rather than having to deal with Sidious and Vader united. Those two Sith Lords fighting as one would be far too much for anyone to deal with, even if it was the Grand Master and Jedi Master Obi-Wan Kenobi. At this point in time, the dark side was far too prevalent in the galaxy, meaning that Vader and Sidious would basically be feeding off of each other's darkness the entire time, growing even more powerful with each passing moment and each stroke of the blade. While Yoda and Obi-Wan, on the other hand, would be slowly worn down by their oppressively powerful opponents. Not to mention, Sidious would likely use Obi-Wan's connection to Anakin to his advantage by perhaps attacking Kenobi while he was trying to reason with his former apprentice. And at the same time, while Obi-Wan was hurling insults at Anakin and shaming him for his decision, the Emperor would be reinforcing his turn to the dark side, strengthening the Chosen One and weakening Kenobi. Yoda was already having to deal with the most powerful opponent he had ever fought before, and he didn't need to be splitting his attention while worrying about Obi-Wan. Which brings us to the next reason. Reason number two is revealed to us in the Revenge of the Sith novelization, and it has to do with the sheer power of Sidious. After Obi-Wan finishes looking at the security tapes, he and Yoda have a very brief but a very important discussion before going off on their assignments to kill the Sith. The following reads, Now Obi-Wan did turn to face Yoda. Palpatine faced Mace, and Aegon, and Kit, and Seisei, four of the greatest swordsmen in our order, perhaps of all of the Jedi Order, by himself. Even both of us together wouldn't have a chance against Sidious. True, Yoda said, but both of us apart. A chance we may create. This moment is highly important because even Kenobi acknowledged that Sidious was far too powerful for the two of them together. The reason for this is most likely that Kenobi and Yoda would just get in each other's way while fighting the Dark Lord, who would have this as an advantage. Clearly, Obi-Wan was terrified of Sidious' saber skill considering how the Sith Lord dispatched those four Jedi Masters. Jedi Masters, who Kenobi references as being the finest duelist their order has produced. And Yoda even agrees with him. Sidious has shown on many occasions that he is extremely proficient against multiple opponents, even using this to his advantage when dueling the Jedi within his office. Yoda was likely the only one that could match Sidious saber to saber, but he had to do so without any other distraction, requiring all of his attention. Having said this, eventually Sidious would have swatted Obi-Wan away like a wasp and killed him, therefore tipping the scales back in favor against Yoda. But Yoda makes an interesting statement about their chances of dividing and fighting the Sith Lords apart. Yoda says that they might be able to create a chance. He, of course, as he always does, is speaking cryptically about the future, but that is unlikely seeing as how he says that he failed at the end of his duel with Sidious. What Yoda probably thought would happen is that Obi-Wan would likely defeat Anakin, which would render Sidious too distracted to fight properly. Perhaps Yoda was banking on the chance that Sidious may flee or surrender if he learned that his powerful apprentice had lost. The evidence for this line of thought comes from what Yoda says when he challenged challenges Sidious at the very beginning of their duel. Faith in your new apprentice, misplaced may be. I believe that Yoda assumed that Obi-Wan would be able to defeat Anakin and do so while Yoda was actually dueling Sidious, meaning this could create an opportunity for Yoda to disarm Sidious or maybe even defeat him in a moment of shock. And now of course, our final reason. The reason of preservation. At the moment, Obi-Wan and Yoda were faced with the dilemma of the fact that they were hopelessly surrounded on all sides. They didn't know who to trust as friend or enemy, and as far as they knew, they were likely the last two Jedi alive in the entire galaxy. There was absolutely no chance of them running the risk of Palpatine wiping out two Jedi at once. The problem was, they knew that if they did fail, they needed at least one of them to be left alive to carry on the legacy of the Jedi in secret. There would have come a day when a new Jedi Order would be risen, and it would need the guiding hand of an experienced Jedi Master. Yoda and Kenobi probably had the exact same idea on this, and didn't want both of them to be caught in the same place, risking the entire existence of the Jedi to their knowledge. This line of reasoning can also be traced to how they chose to be exiled. 
They may have been stronger if they remained together in exile, but rather they split up so as to not have their combined energy in the Force create a beacon of light to be sensed by the Sith. And that, my friends, is why Obi-Wan and Yoda did not face Sidious together. But the Death Star Project was to be the crown jewel of Darth Sidious's empire. And for nearly two decades, the empire pulled in massive amounts of resources in order to build the massive battle station. A battle station capable of destroying entire worlds. The Death Star was designed to be the ultimate symbol of rule for the empire, and was designed to specifically dispel any rebel activity from arising. The goal of Sidious, Tarkin, and Krennic were to create a battle station of such a magnitude that no one would ever dare raise arms against it. With the Empire allotting massive resources, as well as slave labor from worlds such as Kashyyyk, when word reached Darth Sidious that the Death Star had been destroyed, the Empire was dealt a massive blow. Not only was their battle station no more, but the Empire was now proven to be fallible. Before this ever occurred, however, there were two extremely high-ranking Imperial officers who held Palpatine's ear who were staunchly against the Death Star. Individuals that may shock you, in that being Darth Vader and Grand Admiral Thrawn. Let's discuss Thrawn first. What's important about this is that in Star Wars canon, Thrawn was not actually led into the secret of the creation of the Death Star. As an alien, Palpatine respected Thrawn, but he did not allow him all of the secrets of the Empire instantly. However, the genius mind that was Grand Admiral Thrawn was able to deduce that the Empire was building a massive battle station that the galaxy had never seen before. Being able to deduce this thanks to the massive amounts of slave labor, as well as hyperdrive engines and fuel being imported by the Empire daily. Thrawn would even voice his concerns about the Death Star to his subordinates, ones in which he ultimately trusted, stating that he believed that creating one massive weapon was a mistake, and rather that the Empire should seek to expand rather than leave all of its eggs in one basket. Believing while it made the Empire exceptionally powerful, it also made for a massive target. Thrawn believed that the Empire needed to expand its reaches, not consolidate them. Instead, Thrawn was of the belief that they needed to produce more Star Destroyers, as well as naval capital ships, essentially creating the largest fleet that the galaxy had ever seen. Just a few weeks following this, Thrawn was granted a private audience with the Emperor, and although he lacked the specifics of the Death Star, such as the size and true power of the weapon, he warned Sidious about allocating all of their resources into one location. Thrawn then proposed the idea of creating an even larger naval fleet to the Emperor. However, in response, Darth Sidious promised that once the Death Star was fully operational, that they would no longer need a fleet as large as the Empire currently had, that the Death Star would serve as the ultimate sign of Imperial rule. Dismissing Thrawn's concerns about the battle station, in the end, Thrawn would be proven absolutely correct, and this can even be seen in the Rise of Skywalker with Darth Sidious's change of plan. While it is true that the Star Destroyers in the Rise of Skywalker could also destroy planets, and Palpatine's plan is riddled with even more errors here that we won't get into, it is clear that by some extent, he took Thrawn's words to heart, instead opting to control a massive naval fleet rather than a single battle station even though the First Order would try that again. If Thrawn had gotten his way, however, the victory of Luke Skywalker in the trench run in A New Hope would not have meant nearly as much. The Rebels, even if they managed to destroy several capital ships, would still not make a dent in the Imperial Navy. Thrawn was absolutely right, and if the Emperor had embraced Thrawn in this moment, he would have destroyed the Rebellion swiftly. But that answers why Grand Admiral Thrawn was against the creation of the Death Star. But what about that of Lord Vader? Vader realized how powerful such a super weapon truly was, the greatest super weapon to his knowledge that the galaxy had ever seen. Vader's issue was not so much with the battle station itself, but rather with the men that operated it, and the idea that they did not deserve the power that they wielded so freely. He believed that power like that must be earned and understood. Darth Vader went through massive lengths to achieve such a power in the dark side of the Force. He had sacrificed his wife, he had sacrificed his legs and his arms, his family, his code, anybody that he ever cared about. And these men that professed to want to rule the galaxy had sacrificed nothing. This had been given to them in the form of a massive machine, a killing machine. Vader had suffered, been molded, and these men were not worthy. 
Vader simply saw the Death Star as a means for lesser beings to grovel for power. Grovel for power in an empire that they did not own, and their arrogance and enthusiasm over such a battle station and such power infuriated the Dark Lord to no end. So despite all of this, why was Darth Sidious so enthusiastic about the Death Star and pushed for its completion as soon as possible? Well, contrary to the likes of Darth Vader, Darth Sidious had been taught a different sentiment. Very early on in his career as a Sith Lord, Darth Sidious had learned that the machinations of the Force could in some way rebel. When Plagueis and Sidious attempted to spread the dark side across the galaxy and cloud the vision of the Jedi, they also allowed the midichlorians to rebel against them and create the chosen one that was prophesied to destroy them. His own master and Darth Plagueis had experienced this, and this was a lesson that Sidious would not soon forget. Therefore, Sidious pushed for the creation of a battle station of such a size to combat against anything that the Force could throw at him. He did not know from which corner of the galaxy a light side threat may arise, but he knew that one was coming, and instead of strictly falling back on his ability of the Force, Darth Sidious needed something more. He needed something drastic, a battle station with the capabilities to destroy entire worlds. While it's true that the Death Star was meant to be a message, it was also meant to be a contingency plan. With the creation of the Death Star, Sidious believed that any rebellion that sprouted up in the depths of the galaxy could be snuffed out instantaneously, and he would finally have ultimate dominion over the galaxy. The Death Star was to represent the very fist of the Emperor. With a weapon as penultimate as the Death Star, Darth Sidious could do what he always wanted, to sit back in his throne and learn the secrets of the Dark Side, perhaps even perfect the Dark Side itself. The Death Star was enough to rule the galaxy as an iron fist. Palpatine already had the galaxy, and the Death Star was his security. This is where there is the major difference between Thrawn and Sidious. Sidious cared for himself ultimately in the end. He cared for his time and where his efforts were being devoted. Sidious had a passion for the dark side and for knowledge. Thrawn's goals, on the other hand, were to preserve the Empire at all costs. He put the Empire above himself and above his own ego and that is why Grand Admiral Thrawn was correct. And that is why, if the Emperor had simply heeded the warnings of Thrawn, in time, he could have sat back and learned all the secrets that the Dark Side could ever offer him. But anyway, my friends and acolytes, what are your thoughts on this? What are your thoughts on why Thrawn and Darth Vader actively hated the Death Star, and why they were both staunchly against it, for very different reasons? As I sense a plot to destroy the Jedi dark side of the force surrounds the Jedi. What if I told you that the Republic was now under the control of the Dark Lord of the Sith? The dark side of the force surrounds the Chancellor. Interesting words given to us by Mace Windu, but what did the Jedi Master mean by this exactly? Greetings again, acolytes of the Force, welcome back to the archives. It's certainly not a secret that the Jedi Council, Mace Windu in particular, did not trust Supreme Chancellor Palpatine in the slightest bit, especially during the end of the Clone Wars. They all knew something was up, but despite knowing him for many years and being in the same room as him on multiple occasions, they never once went as far as accusing him of being a Sith Lord or the Sith Lord Darth Sidious. It's an ironic thing, but they all somehow knew that Palpatine was up to no good but didn't exactly think he was the Sith that they were looking for. But why exactly is this, and why is it that the Jedi Council outright deemed it impossible for Palpatine to be Sidious? With all the Jedi's insight and intuition, what kept them from seeing what was right in front of their very eyes, and in the same room? Well, we actually have a passage in the Revenge of the Sith novelization that should clear all of this up. So, come along with us today, my acolytes and friends, as we take a look at the Jedi Council's investigation into Sidious, and figure out how Sheev Palpatine eluded their suspicion for so long, until it was far too late. It's honestly bizarre how the Jedi never found out Palpatine's true identity. What many usually talk about when this subject is brought up, is how Sidious is a master at the ability of Force Cloak. How he can mask his presence in the Force by burying his darkness so deep down within himself, it practically disappears, rendering him with the presence of someone who is completely without Force sensitivity. 
a while ago, we also produced a holocron talking about why the Jedi were never able to test Palpatine's blood for midichlorians, but this still doesn't answer the question on why exactly the Jedi were unable to figure this out through deductive reasoning. Count Dooku's admittance of the Republic being controlled by a Dark Lord of the Sith was swept aside by the Jedi Council in a fear-mongering move, a lie to get in their heads and distract the Jedi from the truth. Some consider this to have been a very foolish move, but we have to look at it from the Jedi's perspective. It honestly makes sense and would have been a genius tactic in psychological warfare that Dooku himself was exceptional at, considering his skill in Duan Mok when fighting with a lightsaber. If you remember, Duan Mok is the way of using insults and belittling words to plant poisonous thoughts of fear and doubt into the minds of one's enemies. If done properly, this could actually weaken someone's connection to the Force and blind their sight. Considering this information from Dooku and its source, it's reasonable why the Jedi discarded it. Still, nonetheless, before the Clone Wars broke out, Dooku hinted that Palpatine was a Sith Lord. But again, the Jedi disregarded this as bluffing, and still dragged their feet so long in the investigation of Darth Sidious, who was actually in their own backyard, that it backfired completely. However, near the culmination of the Clone Wars, the Jedi were indeed closing in on the wretched Darth Sidious, and were hot on the track of discovering the truth, as some discoveries which were made later in the war caused them to reconsider what Dooku had said. In fact, the Jedi apparently had figured out that Darth Sidious was indeed hiding in their midst. From the Revenge of the Sith novelization, we have this conversation between Jedi Master Windu and Obi-Wan Kenobi, wherein Windu fills him in on exactly what has been discovered. The following goes. We have circumstantial evidence that traces Sidious back to Palpatine's inner circle. After this, Obi-Wan asks if Mace is certain, and Mace Windu responds, Nothing is certain but this raid. The capture of Palpatine had to be an inside job, and the timing. We were closing in on Sidious, Master Kenobi. We traced the Sith Lord to an abandoned factory in the works, not far from where Anakin landed the cruiser. When the attack on Coruscant began, we were tracking through the down-level tunnels. The trail led to the sub-basement of 500 Republica. The novel then goes on to explain that the 500 Republica is the most elusive address on the entire planet of Coruscant. Its inhabitants included only the wealthiest or most popular of individuals, which of course included Palpatine. The Jedi had basically traced Darth Sidious right to Palpatine's front doorstep and they were about to knock. Obi-Wan then asks Mace Windu if they have any suspects, to which he replies, too many suspects. All we know of Sidious is that he is bipedal, of roughly human conformation. Sait Pestage springs to mind. I wouldn't rule out Masameta either. The Sith Lord might even be hiding among the Red Guards. There's no way to know who Sidious is. Mace goes on to explain that they're not able to question anyone in the office because Palpatine would never allow it, as Mace says that the Chancellor barely even believes that the Sith exist, and there are no living accomplices who know Sidious personally that they can question, since Dooku is dead and Maul is unaccounted for. In this moment, Obi-Wan wonders if Palpatine even has the kind of authority to keep the Jedi from conducting their investigation. And finally, Mace then tells us in these lines why the Jedi Council do not suspect Palpatine is the Sith Lord. The Senate has surrendered so much power, it's hard to say where his authority stops. The only reason Palpatine's not a suspect is because he already rules the galaxy. So with this information, let's break it down. It's interesting how they were convinced that it was someone within Palpatine's inner circle. Windu mentions State Pest Age, as well as Masa Meta as suspects. And while of course neither were Sith Lords, they didn't exactly have clean hands either. State Pest Age was Palpatine's advisor and had been with him since his days as a senator on Naboo. Pest Age was one of the few, along with Masa Meta, that actually was aware of Palpatine's secret identity as Darth Sidious. Pest Age actually carried out a lot of Palpatine's Palpatine's covert work from espionage to outright murder. The dark side of the Force would indeed surround Pestage, so it makes sense that Windu would suspect him. Masa Meta is another obvious choice as well, perhaps even more convincingly because he rarely ever leaves Palpatine's side. As the Grand Vizier, Ameta had immediate access to Palpatine at all times and would often cover for him whenever Palpatine had to do business as Sidious. Both Sate Pestage and Masa Meta definitely look like the type as well, with rather unsightly facial features which included sunken in eyes eyes, wrinkly faces, sharp teeth in Masa Meta's case, and a general dark disposition. With them constantly being around Sidious, it would make sense
Defense of the Jedi thought that they would have his ear in just about everything. But beyond this, Windu even goes as far to suggest that Darth Sidious may even be hiding amidst the Chancellor's Red Guards, which by itself would have been an absolutely fascinating disguise had that actually been the case. But in the idea of it being Palpatine himself, the Jedi essentially believe that Palpatine is indeed a power-hungry, crooked politician. But that's where the suspicion ends, and that's where they think he lies in all of this. What the Jedi truly believe is happening is that Palpatine is being controlled by a Sith Lord within his inner circle, who is using the Chancellor as a puppet without the Chancellor even knowing. According to the Jedi, yes, he's a crooked politician, but he's not so evil that he's a Sith Lord, or he would be an accomplice to one. I think it's very interesting how they believed that Palpatine wouldn't want to try to rule the galaxy, because as Mace Windu says, he already does. The Jedi had absolutely no idea that the ultimate goal of the Sith was going to be a galactic empire. I suppose it's because the Republic had existed for so long that the Jedi believed it was a constant and a permanent state. The Republic had stood for 25,000 years. How could it ever fall? In the natural, there is no way that it would be brought to its knees by one Sith Lord, and not even the entire Sith Empire accomplished this with a massive military and thousands of years of trying to conquer it. But the Jedi had absolutely no idea the kind of power that Sidious truly held over the Senate, or the power of his ambition. Palpatine's misdirection worked, and worked beautifully even though it seems he got a bit cocky and sloppy towards the end where the Jedi were able to track him, and it almost cost him his empire. They, in fact, followed Sidious' trail right to Palpatine's mailbox. It was lucky that Sidious conceived his own kidnapping in time to delay any further investigations. Windu mentioned that the dark side of the Force surrounded the Chancellor. They just didn't assume it was actually the Chancellor himself. But the Galactic Empire was the culmination of everything that Darth Sidious and the entirety of the Sith had been working towards for a millennium. It was the ultimate goal and the grand trophy of the Sith. So why was it that Sidious was ultimately disappointed with how his empire turned out? Greetings, and welcome back to the Archives. A thousand years of training all funneled into one Dark Lord, and this Sith Lord spent the better part of 30 years perfectly setting up and executing the grand plan of the Sith. The revenge of the Sith was complete, and the Jedi were no more. It had been quite a swift triumph, and now the galaxy solely belonged to their new Emperor. Darth Sidious, Palpatine had big plans for the Empire, and the Death Star was only the beginning. He was aiming towards immortality and to reshape the galaxy in his own divine image. And yet, the Empire he found himself running was grossly underwhelming. Palpatine's continual daily frustrations with how things were running was compounding each and every day. Even though he was on top of the galaxy, the power he now held was not enough to quench the burning furnace of his anger that he felt towards his greatest accomplishment and how it was turning out. An utter disappointment of his perfect image. So why exactly was this? Why was Darth Sidious infuriated, frustrated, and disappointed with his grand empire? And what were the major reasons for his critiques? The source we have today comes from the Book of the Sith, where Sidious scrawls his commentary in the margins of the entire book. Sprinkled throughout the works are various side comments that clue us into how Sidious actually felt about his empire. Where we get the most perspective is when he is writing commentary inside of his own chapter in the Book of the Sith. The first quote we can begin with is that at the beginning of the novel itself, where Sidious writes this. At the time I write these words, I hoped my empire would provide limitless reach. Yet, I must still rely on others to do my bidding, and they are so often foolish, flawed, and disappointing. This is our first indication of what Sidious actually got, versus what he expected in the end. Keep in mind, Sidious says this about his underlings, as this will be a consistent problem that creates the through line of Sidious' issues with his empire. Having first conquered the Republic with all of his subterfuge and manipulation, Darth Sidious had assumed that he was finally going to have limitless reach that he desired for so long. Having to work in the shadows as a Sith for the majority of his life saw him having to use proxies and a complicated underground network of contacts for him to get anything done as he personally was unable to work. While at the time he didn't mind it, now it was becoming a nuisance. Now, Emperor Sidious was the law, and could change the law as he desired. 
In his mind, this theoretically should have allowed him to reach to extend all the corners of the galaxy and would never be denied what he desired. So what was it that Sidious desired? Well, knowledge, usually. With the resources that the Empire had, Sidious should have been able to pierce every dark corner of the galaxy to find long-lost knowledge and power hidden away for centuries. Not to mention all the resources that could be gained from systems in the Outer Rim, in unknown regions that were typically closed off to the rest of the galaxy. And yet, this just wasn't the case. One of the biggest problems impeding his research was the Imperial Senate itself, a Senate which took Sidious 19 years to fully dissolve. Despite the fact that he was the Emperor, he still had to play his cards right within the Senate until he could completely oust them and replace their influence with the Imperial Governors. But until such a time, he still had to be careful, even as Emperor. Sidious notes in the book that he wished that he had dissolved the Senate a lot sooner, but that wasn't his only impediment. As he mentioned, he was still forced to work through servants, but they weren't as efficient enough for his taste. They didn't have the know-how to get things done properly, and it wasn't as though Sidious could go and do everything himself. Putting his Sith pride aside, he was an emperor. Running the galaxy was a full-time job and it wasn't like he was getting a whole lot of help from Vader running it, who, at this point in time, was still moping about Padme and had become so obsessed with hunting and killing Jedi survivors that the Empire itself meant merely nothing to him. Palpatine's greatest critique of Lord Vader. Vader did not desire to rule anything. He desired to conquer his past self. Speaking of Jedi, the Inquisitors weren't very useful either and were not all that helpful with Vader hunting and killing the remaining Jedi. We spoke of earlier why Sidious actually despised the Inquisitors, and we can revisit this quote from him. Grand Inquisitor Torben is the latest of these fools to perish. A bomb? A speeder crash? Drowning? In death, my Inquisitors are making a mockery of their empire's infallibility. When Palpatine needed the Inquisitors to break Vader free of his obsession with the Jedi, they failed him. The Inquisitors were valuable to a point, but often died swiftly and embarrassingly in a way that left Palpatine himself humiliated. As well as this, furthering Vader's obsession with killing Jedi. But it only got worse. Emperor Palpatine was facing insurgency issues on the newly conquered worlds that he had claimed. Palpatine used fear to keep his citizens in line. However, he began becoming more and more infuriated when the inefficiency and ineptitude began to creep into his higher ranks. About this, he had to say, it is maddening educating this rabble. With the Empire now nearly a generation old, my Imperial Governor should at least understand the principle of the Law of Fear. And yet, I would have better success trying to teach Abresh to a Gungan. We are fully aware of this, especially with worlds like Lothal, as the Ghost Crew was able to wreak havoc on the planet, and eventually, fully win it back from the Empire. The Prime Minister was unable to quell the insurgency, and so was Agent Callus from the ISB. Not even the Inquisitors, three of them in fact. And still, it took Grand Admiral Thrawn to make a real dent. To summarize, we could basically wrap all of this up into one final quote by Darth Sidious concerning all of the Empire. The defining quote says this, My Empire, so perfect in vision, has at times proved infuriating in its implementation because of the fact of the sloth and stupidity of my underlings. Even Vader, my minor masterpiece, is often weak and indecisive. It is fortunate that I have an eternity to outlive my errors. And there it is. Not only was Palpatine collecting Sith artifacts and knowledge for the fun of it, rather, he was desperately researching the secret to immortality, the essence transfer technique discovered by Darth Bane and lost by the foolish Sith Lord Darth Gravith. Sidious, in his mind, believed that he had to start from the ground up to rebuild his empire, to outlive those that were still greedy, rebuild a new generation completely indoctrinated to his sole will. While Sidious still had a treasure trove of Sith knowledge, perfect immortality still always eluded him, causing him to grow more and more frustrated with the constant fires he was having to put out in his massively imperfect empire with a thousand years of Sith plotting ultimately leading to a disappointment, even in the eyes of their Emperor. A cruel, dark reality for this Sith Lord. But now, my friends and acolytes, what are your thoughts on Sidious's utter disappointment with his Empire? Versus, of course, what he had in his mind. 
What are your thoughts on the insurgencies and the incompetency of his underlings, as well as Vader and the Inquisitor? Was Sidious right to be as furious as he was about the resulting Empire? According to Lord Sidious himself, Grandmaster Yoda was perhaps the most powerful and dangerous Jedi that had ever lived. In fact, he is the only Jedi that Sidious ever referred to as a true rival to his power. The only genuine threat to his plans, the rest of the Jedi were simply playthings. But Grandmaster Yoda, with his centuries of wisdom, knowledge, and power, made him a genuine threat. This is why it is all the more curious why following Order 66 in their grand duel in the Senate, that Darth Sidious never followed up on the whereabouts of Yoda, the greatest threat to his empire before its rise. And yet, Darth Sidious felt no need to pursue Grandmaster Yoda, no need to follow up on the whereabouts of the the greatest threat to his galactic empire. But why exactly was this? Why was it that Darth Sidious seemed to not even think about Yoda following the rise of the empire? Why was Sidious so content with letting the old Jedi go? Well today, students of the Force, we have a definitive answer from a canon source, as we will be reading directly from the novel Stories of the Jedi and Sith. As finally, from the very mouth and mind of Darth Sidious himself, we have an explanation why he never felt the need to follow up on Yoda, why he never felt the need to hunt him down following Order 66, and why he felt the powers of the Grand Master were now obsolete. Darth Sidious catches himself on the rail of the repulsor pod, gasping for breath. He can barely breathe, energy surging through him as he pulls himself slowly up. He turns to look for Master Yoda, laughing again. All he sees, though, is the Jedi's ugly brown cloak drifting down like discarded trash. The clone soldiers come, and they do not find a body. Nearly 20 years later, now on the throne on high in the spire of his isolation tower on the Death Star Mark II, the Sith Lord, the Emperor, thinks about the old Jedi, their unfinished duel. It does not haunt him. He has no regrets that might cause a haunting whatsoever. He won. He so obviously won. Grandmaster Yoda slunk away to hide. Sidious rose to the apex of the galaxy. Everyone calls him Emperor now. Everybody fears him. Merely look at any corner of his galaxy and see evidence that he won that duel. But all the same, he'd like to end Master Yoda himself. Not with his own two hands, of course, but with the shock of a red saber. A compelling side note here. Darth Sidious never actually favored using a lightsaber whatsoever. In fact, he considered the weapon to be obsolete next to his grand powers in the Force itself. But this line is compelling because Darth Sidious has the urge to prove himself superior to the Jedi and Grandmaster Yoda in every way possible. Even if it means lowering himself to using a lightsaber, he still has the urge to prove himself superior to the Jedi with their own weapon. And it's compelling that nearly 20 years later, he still feels that urge to best Grandmaster Yoda blade to blade. Moving on. Collect Yoda's little lightsaber once the green creature is dead, and set it with the others. With all the trophies in the Imperial Palace, the lightsaber will look like a toy beside the rest. Useless. Silly. There will be no one left called Master but himself. He has looked, set the Inquisitor's program to seek Yoda's hiding place, made certain the Hunter probes know his name and his specs. Once or twice, the Emperor considered various arcane Sith rituals that might instigate some sort of echo or threat of the Force to lead him to Yoda's location. But the Emperor has never performed them. Why bother? Why waste his own power on a mere irritation? Wherever Yoda is, his power is so diminished he can be no threat to the Empire. But sometimes, when Palpatine sinks into the Force, drinking it up like the endless source of power it is, his feelings drift along to a distant thread of anger, sparks of hate, and in a far-flung place, he senses a fleeting moment of familiarity. It never amounts to anything if he bothers locating it, and over the years he has spent with the dark side, his feelings diffusing throughout and sucking up power, the very easy touch of Yoda's name has become meditative. I defeated you. I chased you away and took everything that was yours. The things you stood for are now ashes. You remain, and as long as you do, I will always win. But the rest of the time, Palpatine prefers to see Yoda again, just long enough to watch him die. He sits on his throne and stares out the massive viewport. He has sent the fleet away. Below the battle station hangs Endor, milky clouds just in his field of vision. 
Within a few short weeks, the jaws of this trap will snap closed around the Rebel Alliance. His apprentice will break a final time, and Vader's son will take his place. There will be no rebirth of the Jedi. The Emperor smiles, and then he laughs. He hopes, after all, that Yoda is alive that the old Grand Master Yoda will know when these final remnants of the Republic and the Jedi are crushed, that he will sense it, feel the pain of it. Yes, yes, Vader is coming, approaching the space dock to speak to his master about the search for his son, and he feels the Emperor's satisfaction pouring through the dark side itself. We can glean a lot of information from this small passage. First, we learn that Darth Sidious did actually search for Yoda, but not out of a sense for anybody to destroy him if not himself personally. This would in fact mark the only Jedi that Sidious wanted to best and kill personally, as he was quite content with having every other Jedi either killed by the Inquisitors or Vader himself if they proved to be powerful. But Yoda was special. Yoda was the opposite side of the coin. The other thing we learn is that Darth Sidious is quite contempt with Yoda being alive. In fact, he even finds peace in the thought. The idea that Yoda will have to perceive the very galaxy in its brand new transformed state, a galaxy ruled solely by the Sith. If anything, Darth Sidious seems almost glad that Yoda is alive. And in this final moment, in a final moment where he believes he will turn the Skywalker's son forever, he hopes within his very soul that the Grand Master is alive. But we also learn something else extremely interesting. That being, that despite Yoda hiding on Dagobah for two decades, the Emperor can sense something. There is something that bothers him every time he reaches out through the dark side itself. Something that tells him that Yoda is still alive. Meaning that despite living on Dagobah and hiding his presence in the Force for two decades, Yoda's presence is so powerful that the Emperor knows he is still out there somewhere. But again, he views him and perceives him as no threat. He wants him to suffer as much as possible, live with the knowledge of his ultimate failure. But anyway, my friends and fellow acolytes of the Force, what are your thoughts on this? And what are your thoughts on us finally getting a full explanation directly from the mind and mouth of Sidious himself? Are you satisfied with the reasoning why Darth Sidious never hunted Grandmaster Yoda following Order 66? As always, my friends and acolytes in the Force, may the Force be with you, and I hope that you're having a great day. The destruction of the Death Star was the crowning achievement of Luke Skywalker's early life, but reflection of this event later in Luke's life caused him to believe that the Force itself had orchestrated the entire thing. Hello again, and welcome back to our archives. To say that the Force had a hand in destroying the Death Star is an obvious statement. However, Luke actually states that the Force was in far more control than we initially thought during that trench run. Many Jedi, of course, speak of the will of the Force and how it intervenes and influences them, as well as how a situation ultimately turns out. However, the will of the Force is a powerful influence and one that directs the course of galactic history. And according to this account by Luke Skywalker, we might even be able to deduce that it is against the will of the Force for any superweapon to ever exist. So, come along with us today, Acolytes of the Force, as we open up yet another holocron and explain exactly why the will of the Force and the Force itself despises superweapons. First though, if you haven't already joined our archives, be sure to reach out with the Force and crush or push that subscribe button. It is your destiny. The Death Star is one of the worst machines of destruction to ever exist. A battle station with the ability to destroy a planet is an affront on the natural order of the Force itself, which of course means that the living Force must become involved. We learn of Luke Skywalker's opinion in Palpatine's chapter on the Book of the Sith, where Luke scrawls in the margins where Sidious had been talking about the Death Star. This is what Luke says on the matter. I may have been the one who fired that shot, but the Force itself wanted to purge the galaxy of the Death Star. It was the embodiment of everything that's wrong with the dark side. This statement comes as no surprise that the Force itself would disapprove of something that could destroy billions, if not trillions of lives in a blink of an eye. 
And we find this constant invisible struggle between the light and the dark sides of the Force very intriguing. The two sides of the Force seem to use the heroes and denizens of the galaxy as pieces in their war. In the era of the Galactic Civil War, the dark side was far more powerful and prevalent in the galaxy than it had ever been. And one might think that the Death Star itself was the champion of the dark side. An energy bent on destruction and chaos would certainly enjoy the token of a planet-destroying superweapon. Well, the Force itself does not actually work this way, and this is not entirely correct, as even perhaps the dark side disapproved of the Death Star. The Force must always remain in balance, and the Force was trying to correct itself in this era as Luke Skywalker was the rising threat to the Vader and his Emperor. While the dark side likely was enjoying having its influence spread across the galaxy, the Death Star was a problem, as were all other superweapons. The dark side may champion death, however, it has its limits. Believe it or not, there exist certain objects in the galaxy that bring so much death that even the dark side wants nothing to do with them. For this, we can look to the item known as the Dark Staff in Legends continuity, a weapon so powerful and so evil that the dark side itself tried and failed to destroy it. What Luke says concerning the Death Star can also be said about other superweapons. If you want proof, then let's ask this question. Why is it that all other superweapons are always hidden or destroyed shortly after they are found? Darth Revan and Malak got away with using it once or twice for militaristic purposes, but as soon as Malak glassed the surface of Taurus with an orbital bombardment, that became a problem, and the Starforge was destroyed soon thereafter. The Silent Reaper had the ability to drain the life out of an entire army and was used in the days of the old Sith Wars by the Sith Ulic Keldroma. However, it was lost to history, and even though Darth Malgus searched for it endlessly, he never found the great weapon. However, it would be rediscovered in a completely different spot at some point during the Clone Wars, but then hidden away once again. And then of course, the next horrific superweapon to grace the galaxy, the Mass Shadow Generator, which requires no introduction. The Mass Shadow Generator was destroyed during the devastation of Malachor V, when Lady Dominique tried to rebuild it. However, it was destroyed once again by the Galactic Alliance leader before it could be used to devastate the galaxy one final time. These are but a small few of the superweapons that have existed, and then were promptly and conveniently disposed of. But what exactly does this mean into the relationship with the Force? And why would the dark side itself have an affront to superweapons? What is its hidden agenda? The answer to this conundrum lies in four deadly words. Those words are wounds in the Force. Objects with the capability to wipe out life on such a colossal scale in so quick of an instant just cannot happen without any repercussion. And the consequence of this is a wound in the Force. Wounds in the Force are a much more serious problem than people often give them credit for. All life in the galaxy was interconnected, and when a significant number of lives are suddenly ended, the Force sustained a localized injury, much like a sentient would lose a limb. The epicenter of the wound became a dark and terrible place, filled with the reverberating echoes of pain, terror, and suffering. The blinking out of all life that had moments earlier existed there in harmony. The dark side and the light side may be on opposite ends of the spectrum, but they both still consist of one energy. That energy is the Force. The dark side may be chaos, but it is not death for death's sake. And while wounds in the Force may often cause the dark side to become more prevalent, it doesn't mean that it isn't still a problem. Otherwise, the dark side wouldn't care about objects and people that wish to destroy everything like the Dark Staff, Valkorion, or the Null Null. All entities and beings that the dark side itself opposed. One of the worst instances of wounds in the Force being created was of course Nihilus himself, a Sith Lord born of the Mass Shadow Generator. Nihilus was important because he was literally a walking wound in the Force, and it became a dark hole in him that threatened to consume his entire being. Nihilus joined the Sith not out of a desire for their cause, but out of a necessity so that he might use their knowledge to continuously feed his hunger, the undying hunger within himself. Nihilus would drain life out of everything and anything he could until he grew strong enough in the Force where he could have consumed entire worlds if he desired, creating even more wounds wherever he went. The concept of wounds is why no matter how powerful they are, all those who have the desire to destroy will themselves be destroyed. So if this is the case, why then did the Sith continue to create these superweapons? Well, we have to look at how the Sith view the Force itself. The Sith are not necessarily servants of the dark side. 
they, on the other hand, believe that the dark side should be servants to their own will and their own power. An analogy used before, but the Force is like a river. The Jedi seek to move with it in harmony and peace, continuing the natural order of all things. And yet, the Sith seek to dominate this river, use its energies and powers for their own Maleficent goals. This is the rule and paradox that comes as a result of a Force wound. And this is why the Force cannot and will not allow super weapons to exist or be used for very long at all. Luke Skywalker hit the nail on the head with his assessment. He was the one pilot in the X-Wing. He may have been the one to fire the shot, but it was the Force working through him that ultimately purged the galaxy of the Death Star. The Jedi Order has more or less been the actual symbol of the Republic prosperity for the past several thousand years. Time and time again, the Republic fell into disarray or had a war come upon them and each time it was the Jedi that rose to their defense and to the defense of the innocent. The Republic and the Jedi had become so integral to one another that it eventually would cause both of their downfalls to occur at the end of the Clone Wars. But before then, any time there was a problem to threaten peace and justice of the Republic, you can bet that the Jedi were right there to fix it all. By all accounts, one might think that the citizens of the galaxy would adore the Jedi Knights and hail them as heroes wherever they went. However, things were not so simple nor favorable for the wielders of the light side. While the Republic citizens enjoyed the freedom and peace that came with being protected by the Jedi, they most certainly did not feel safe. In fact, today we have uncovered a certain source that suggests that the time before Revenge of the Sith, most citizens of the galaxy actively feared the Jedi, the peacekeepers that had saved them for generations and thousands of years. So how did this come about and come about so quickly? Was it propaganda by Sidious, the people's general misunderstanding of how the Force worked, or perhaps something much deeper and more terrible? Perhaps it is far more tragic than any of these. Only one way to find out. Come along with us today, my friends and acolytes, as we open up yet another holocron, explaining exactly why the innocents despised and actively feared the Jedi. Our source today comes from the very beginning of the Revenge of the Sith novelization, wherein we get a narration of what all of the citizens of the Republic are feeling whilst helplessly watching Coruscant get attacked by the Separatists. General Grievous has swept in and snatched their beloved Chancellor Palpatine, and now it seemed as if all hope was lost for the war. Everyone was waiting on the edge of their seats for the arrival of Kenobi and Anakin in order to bring an end to the terrible development. However, many of the adults were worried that Anakin and Kenobi may not show up because they are trapped, delayed, or even dead. The book then goes on to say that some citizens of the galaxy are worried that the two Jedi might have even fallen. We are going to read now from the book directly so that we can understand the mind of the collective citizens of the Republic. They might have fallen because the stories are out there. Not on the Holonet, of course. The Holonet news is under the control of the Office of the Supreme Chancellor, and not even Palpatine's renowned candor would allow tales like these to be told. But still, people hear whispers. Whispers of names that the Jedi would like to pretend never existed. Sora Bulk, Depa Balava, Jedi who have fallen to the dark side, who have joined the Separatists, or worse, who have massacred civilians, or even murdered their comrades. The adults have a sickening suspicion that the Jedi cannot be trusted, not anymore. That even the greatest of them can suddenly just snap. This chilling passage lays things out pretty plainly. But what sticks out the most about the entire thing is that the average citizens are aware of fallen Jedi and know their names like Sora Bulk and Depa Balava. Sora Bulk was a Jedi master present on Geonosis, and he had been one of Mace Windu's colleagues, the man who helped him in the creation of the Lightsaber 7 form variant, Vapad. Because of the nature of the form, this brought the Jedi dangerously close to the dark side, and Sora Bulk would be the first to fall victim to its allure. Sora Bulk would lead a revolt against the Jedi, and in Legends, he even killed the council member Opo Rancisis. Depa Balava might confuse a few people, as she in canon is the master of Kanan Jarrus and died during Order 66. However, in Legends, Depa would fall to the dark side after losing her sanity on a jungle world due to the horrors of the Clone War. 
She was plagued by nightmares and finally just snapped and went rogue, but not before sending a concerning message back to the office of the Supreme Chancellor. Mace Windu coincidentally also had to deal with this situation personally because Master Balaba, Mace Windu's own former apprentice, also knew Vapad, making her a distinct threat if she was allowed to go rogue. If the common individual of the galaxy knew of these names, names like Paris Offee, Quinlan Voss, and maybe even Pong Krell would quickly be on their tongues. It was believed that Depa and Sora Bulk were private Jedi matters, but no, the citizens of the very Republic, the galaxy, knew of them. Knew of these beings that wielded exceptional power that were turning to the dark side in record numbers. And now I will mention a name that every citizen of the Republic knew, Count Dooku the leader of the Separatist political party. With this though also raises a dangerous question. How exactly does the average person of the galaxy know of these instances? Well, we believe that they were cleverly spread as covert propaganda by Sidious to people of the Republic so that the seeds of doubt and fear for the Jedi would be carefully planted and cultivated over the course of the war. However, it is interesting that we are actually told specifically that the Hollow Net News does not play stories of fallen Jedi. It is even stated that not even Palpatine allows these stories to be run publicly, which means Sidious had to spread them by other means. Sidious played his hand very carefully in these scenarios. After all, he needed to maintain his cover above anything. His cover is Chancellor to the Republic and friend to the Jedi. It all hinges on the fact that Palpatine's arrest comes at such as a shock because Palpatine himself was such a clear and public supporter of the Jedi. If he slipped up and revealed that they are not as chummy and friendly as they really are, then this would mean disaster. Sidious would need these tales of the fallen Jedi to go through other informants. Perhaps loud and drunk clone troopers in the bar have spread this information, or a few average citizens were given this news to gossip freely with. There is also a possibility that Dooku and the Separatist media run these stories, and the Republic citizens hear of it through trade. However it was spread, though all the breadcrumbs would eventually lead directly back to Palpatine. This was a dark time for the Republic. The war was creeping closer and closer to their doorstep. The Jedi were spread thin, and those that weren't dropping by the dozens were apparently turning to the dark sides. News of five or six of them going rogue was exceptionally rare, and killing groups of people to inspire quite a bit of rage and mistrust worked brilliantly. Guardians of the peace, they were killing people now, the very people they protected for generations. The citizens know that after all the Jedi may be an elite organization of warrior monks, but in the end, they're still people, flawed, and prone to the same things that the average person is prone to. The problem is though, the Jedi are just as flawed people that wield a great power far beyond anything the average galactic citizen has ever known. The time of the oppression of the Sith was over in the eyes of the average citizen. And now, the Jedi were taking over. When you look at it this way, it's no wonder that the common people of the galaxy would be terrified if one of the Jedi were to just snap. Why is it that we believe that Darth Sidious actually openly held disdain for the Darksaber? Greetings, curious acolytes of the Force, and welcome back to our archives. At the end of Season 5 of The Clone Wars, we got an epic battle depicted between Maul, ruler of Mandalore, and Darth Sidious, lord of the Sith and soon to be Emperor of the Galaxy. The duel took place in the palace throne room of Mandalore and then continued out into the public square. Though it was night at that point, there were no witnesses to this epic battle taking place. The only person who would know about this would be Prime Minister Almec, who saw the duel on the security holotapes after it had concluded. In this duel, Maul and Savage would be put in their place by the Dark Lord, and Maul would get a rude reminder of just how far away the real power of the dark side truly was. After it was all said and done, Maul was left defeated and disarmed of the titular item that gave him rulership over Mandalore, the Darksaber. At this moment, Darth Sidious had every right and ability to claim the Darksaber for his own and become recognized as the ruler of Mandalore. However, he did not. We have speculated why Sidious did not do this in a previous holocron. However, today we are going to talk about a theory that we have in which Darth Sidious may have actually despised the Darksaber and disdained what it represented. Before we launch into this holocron though, reports have reached the High Council that many of the acolytes passing through our archives have not yet enrolled. So if you would like to be updated whenever we post our daily holocron uploads, be sure to reach out and force crush that subscribe button. It is your destiny. 
Now, onto the holocron at hand. It's certainly a curious thing that Sidious treats the Darksaber with such contempt. Maul actually had the right idea by claiming the Saber for his very own, and instantly building himself a powerful group of allies with the Death Watch. As he now had full control over Mandalore, and went from prisoner to ruler in the span of one afternoon. It was this act which actually put Maul back on Sidious's radar up until that point. And it was the Darksaber that caused Sidious to now believe that his former apprentice was a viable threat. Until then, Maul had been committing relatively low-profile crimes, which were beneath Sidious's notice. It was one thing for his apprentice to have survived his injuries, but it was another to have completely risen from the ashes as a new player in the game and to have taken over Mandalore. And even more than this, drawn the Jedi Order's attention. Even Sidious himself expressed that he was impressed with Maul and bestowed him the highest and most dangerous dangerous honor that the Dark Lord of the Sith can give to any living creature, the status of becoming a rival. It is important to note that Sidious wasn't just impressed with Maul's ability to have survived, but also survived likely what would have been a lethal blow. Not just anyone comes back from being bisected by a lightsaber. While that was grandiose and all, what really made Palpatine turn his head towards his old apprentice was that Maul exercised enough guile and tact to have taken over an entire system in less than a week. You have to understand that to Darth Sidious, this kind of action was the true way of the modern Sith. He had raised Maul to be nothing more than an assassin, someone to do the dirty work of slaying Sidious's enemies in the shadows, and he never intended him to be his real apprentice or anything more than a dog that he could sick on people. But Maul, all by himself, progressed beyond these confines and found his niche with the Mandalorians, a warrior people of whose language Maul was proficient in the language of war. And by this point, Maul even threatened Palpatine's supremacy. Darth Maul had to go, and Sidious needed to take care of it personally, leaving nothing to chance. So despite his newfound power, Maul was simply no match for his old master, and by the time the Dathomirian warrior figured this out, the duel was over. Maul was disarmed by Sidious, his red lightsaber as well as the darksaber being tossed in opposite directions. After getting a satisfying amount of torture in, Sidious had taken Maul into custody. At this point, we aren't sure whether Sidious just left the darksaber there or actually took notice of it, but ultimately decided to throw the weapon aside. Either way, the sabers were left there in the square, and Prime Minister Almec took careful measures in order to retrieve them. By the rules of the darksaber, Darth Sidious in this moment could have claimed it as his own and became the rightful ruler of Mandalore by way of fair challenge. However, he did not. Our question originally was, does Sidious even know about the legend of the Darksaber? However, surely he would know about this single weapon that would grant him instantaneous rulership of an entire planet. So then, why did he not go after it? We think that it's obvious that Sidious would know of the Darksaber. Its legacy wasn't exactly a secret, and force-based artifacts is one of Sidious's favorite hobbies. There's no doubt in our minds that he knew of the Darksaber and what it represented. We even believe that Darth Maul claiming the Darksaber is what noted him worthy of Sidious's time. But while Sidious may have known about the Darksaber, he probably simply did not care. And his relationship with normal lightsabers was likely reflected in the Darksaber as well. It is our theory that Sidious knows plenty about the weapon and actually despises its legacy and everything that it represents. The Darksaber was a weapon created by a Jedi, which can grant one instant rulership over an entire system of powerful warriors, so long as it is one in combat. What this means in Sidious's perspective is that any fool can get ownership of Mandalore and its people, so long as brute strength sways their way in a battle. Not to mention, we already know that Sidious despises lightsabers in general. Sidious believes that real power lies not in weaponry, but in the power of the Force, and the ability to control people with the strength of mind. Sidious does not care about proving himself to lesser beings, or about ruling with respect and honor. Sidious wants to rule with fear, and he wants people to recognize his supremacy not because of some trinket, but because of the abilities of the Force. For Sidious, real power does not lie in ceremony and superstition, and it certainly doesn't lie in the possession of a single weapon. For Sidious, real power lies in the dark side of the Force, the fear that grips people whenever you walk into a room, and the ability to change the course of galactic history with a snap of your fingers or a word from your tongue, a phrase even. 
a phrase such as execute order 66. Sidious believes his rulership is granted to him by his birthright. He sees the galaxy as his to claim, and the dark side is the catalyst in which he does so. Sidious scoffs at the notion of needing to earn the respect of lesser beings via trial combat. The Sith have moved so far beyond this that it would be an insult to himself and everything that he built if he were to lower himself to that standard. Here's the difference. The system of the Darksaber puts the power of rulership in the weapon rather than the individual. Palpatine wants his words to be law because it is his word, not because he owns some trinket, some Jedi superstitious lightsaber. And this is why we truly believe that Sidious despises the Darksaber and why he refused to claim it or even take note of it. But my friends, we now open the Datacrons up to you. What are your thoughts on this theory? And be sure to let us know your own speculations in adding or detracting from our theory. I have the power to save the one you love. You must choose. It was the eve of Palpatine's triumph, the eve of the triumph of the very Sith. As Sidious sat within the Chancellor's office, he smiled, as he sensed two very distinct things reaching out to him through the Force, although they themselves did not know it yet. He could feel the determination, the valor, the righteousness of four Jedi Masters swiftly approaching his chambers, ready to cut him down in a moment's notice if he indeed proved himself to be a Sith Lord, a certainty that they all held close to their hearts. But as he sat and wait patiently, like a venomous snake laid in the grass, he could sense something else, something else that brought him immense joy. He felt peril, grief, an uncertainty, a strike contrast to the Jedi who were growing ever closer with every step of the hallway. Sidious could sense the emotions and the feelings of Anakin Skywalker in the Jedi Temple, as Anakin realized that by alerting the Jedi, he may have just signed the death warrant of his very wife. He senses the change of heart in the young Skywalker, and Palpatine's grin grows wider. Greetings, students of the Force and acolytes of the galaxy, back to our archives. And today, we intend to settle one of the biggest debates in all of Star Wars lore, and explain why, at least from Palpatine's point of view, he actually could have defeated Mace Windu in Revenge of the Sith, and why ultimately he decided not to. The reasoning behind this and this archive entry comes from two sources. The first is the Revenge of the Sith novelization, which we'll cover later in the video. And the second is a book authored directly by Darth Sidious, known as the Book of the Sith, in the section titled Anger. Before we begin, however, we do want to say that this is strictly from Darth Sidious's point of view, and it's completely possible that in his arrogance, he is lying about the outcome of the duel. But if everything Sidious says is true, then it may indicate that he did actually win the duel with Mace Windu in the Chancellor's Chambers. So come along today, Acolytes of the Force, and let's answer perhaps the most highly debated topic in all of Star Wars lore. The Book of Anger was authored by Darth Sidious immediately following Order 66 and the beginning of the end of the Jedi. As he scribbled, he quickly wrote the section Anger. In the Book of Anger, Darth Sidious writes about how much he respected the ancient Sith Lord Darth Malgus, but in his searching through the Force, something else was revealed to the Dark Lord. Darth Sidious became aware that the Jedi were not the only light side based threat in the galaxy that would need to be eliminated, or, for his greater benefit, turned. Even if the Jedi were gone, there were still many Force sensitives littered throughout the galaxy that strictly followed the light and rejected the dark. In order to stop this, Darth Sidious would implement something that he had tested against Anakin Skywalker. Three steps that Sidious believed could turn any light side wielder to the darkness forever, and therefore become a slave to his rule. Anakin was the guinea pig, and it was the duel between Mace Windu and Palpatine in Anakin's final decision that proved Darth Sidious correct. The first step in turning an individual to the darkness forever was to find something that they desired above anything else. In the case of Anakin, this was his wife Padme, but this could come in many forms, be it riches, outright power, or even safety and sanctuary. If Darth Sidious could identify exactly what they needed, then he could control it and manipulate it. In the case of Anakin, we have several sources that indicate that Palpatine directly fostered the relationship between Padme and the young Skywalker, drawing them closer together in an event that would benefit him twofold. He realized that by placing this temptation within the path of Anakin, this was his ultimate play. 
Because without Padme, Anakin would never betray the Jedi, because what would he have? But if Palpatine could control the only thing that Anakin truly loved above anything else, he could control the young Jedi. And all it would take on behalf of Darth Sidious was to promise the powers that the dark side could grant. Powers that could save Padme from certain death. But here is where things get tricky. Now, Palpatine had to test this love, and thus, the second step commenced. The test itself. Palpatine had to test Anakin Skywalker's resolve to do anything to save his wife, even if it meant betraying the very order that raised him, an order that deemed him the Chosen One. And this test presented itself perfectly in the form of none other than four Jedi rushing to his chambers. Palpatine explained that once he had acquired the thing that somebody truly loved, that this would need to be tested without fail by causing a scene of immediate danger, either danger to Anakin's principles or to Padme directly. What this meant is that if Mace Windu were to strike down Darth Sidious, the secrets of the dark side and the secrets to saving Padme would be struck down with him. A promise that Darth Sidious had made to Anakin not more than a day earlier. This all goes to show that Darth Sidious created this event and this moment for Anakin Skywalker, a shatter point within the Force itself. A moment where Anakin would either have to choose Padme or the Jedi, but where he truly failed and what Darth Sidious was fascinated by is Anakin failed to realize that he did not choose Padme, he chose the dark side. But what of the third step, and what of the ultimate culmination of Darth Sidious's plans? In this moment, Darth Sidious had to ensure their turn forever, and here, he would have to force them to make a decision that would forever alter their path. He would have to push them too far. He would have to push them to the point where they would hate themselves, all initially in the name for what they loved. But now that the evil rod of the dark side was within their very souls, there was no turning back, because with this rot and this anger brought great intoxicating power. In order to cement Vader's turn, he had to do something that Anakin never would have. Anakin would have to march upon the Jedi Temple. He would have to kill Jedi who he had known for years, decades, kill them all from young and old, from powerful to pitiful. So with this, he had to orchestrate from the very beginning him losing the duel to Mace Windu, the three steps into action, three steps that he would then plague the rest of the galaxy that could touch the Force with. He had to identify the thing that they loved more than anything, threaten it, and cause them to act immediately. By threatening the death of Darth Sidious would also bring along the death of all of the secrets to the dark side that may save Padme. This forced Anakin to compromise his morals and ideals in that moment, and in that moment, as Sidious stated, he did not choose Padme, he chose the dark side, he chose the secrets, and he chose the power that it could grant him. And in the end, he had to push Anakin too far, he had to make him personally march upon the Jedi Temple, to kill the younglings, and cement his fall to the dark side. So, in the end, what does this tell us about the duel with Mace Windu? Well, this indicates that Palpatine did in fact fabricate his loss, that he put his very life in danger to force Anakin to make a choice. But is this true, or is this a complete fabrication on behalf of Sidious? Was Mace Windu's Vapad truly too much for the Dark Lord? And is this simply Darth Sidious posturing after being defeated by a Jedi Master? That what did Palpatine actually think of his disfigured face? Welcome back, acolytes of our archives, we've been waiting for you. The shriveled and repulsive appearance of Darth Sidious is the famous iconic look of the Emperor. Thanks to a violent duel with Windu, ever since the events of Coruscant at the climax of the Clone Wars, she Palpatine has been forever transformed, or rather revealed, from that kindly look of a Naboo senator to the repulsive monster that is the Emperor of the Galaxy. In both Legends and Canon Continuity, Sidious doesn't seem to pay much mind to what happened, but is more focused on the immediate concerns, turning Anakin to the dark side and executing Order 66. The rise of the Empire was at hand, and they had to move very quickly. The only thing he did about his appearance was don a cloak, and the only time we know of him mentioning it was during the Senate meeting when he said that the attempt on his life had left him scarred and deformed. But of course, this was only a sympathy play, and one to manipulate the Senate into granting him the powers of an Emperor, as well as to turn the galaxy against the Jedi. 
very rarely do we ever see Sidious share his real opinion about what happened to him and what the dark side has done to his face. But now, my friends, our researchers have found something very interesting in both the Darth Plagueis novel as well as the Revenge of the Sith novelization that paints a distinct picture of Palpatine's views on his own appearance and disfigurement, and what we found defines his character perfectly. So, come along with us today as we open up another holocron and see what the Dark Lord of the Sith thinks about vanity. Sheev Palpatine as a senator and the Supreme Chancellor usually cared a great deal for his appearance, not only to look professional, but also to play the part of an innocent senator from Naboo. The planet and very culture of Naboo centered greatly on their distinct appearances. For them, fashion was not just about extravagant hairstyles, colorful outfits, and expensive jewelry, but all of this was a very important representation of their very culture. The people of Naboo greatly honor their history and have gone through great lengths to ensure the survival of their ancestral styles, down to and including the distinct makeup that the queen wears. So when he is trying to project his facade as the queen's ambassador from Naboo, Palpatine is very careful to continue to observe all their fashion customs, which includes making sure his own facial appearance was kept up. However, we do learn that as a boy, young Palpatine actually scorned all of the intricate fashion of his home world. He despised the fluff and the frills, and even heavily disliked diverse color palettes. Sheev liked uniformity in design, and a simplistic color palette to boot. This is why when the Emperor took over, everything was just black, white, and gray. As soon as he became the Emperor, Palpatine removed his Red Chancellor robes and donned an all-black cloak. But what does all of this have to do with his face? In Palpatine's younger years, he was rather handsome, and he used this fact greatly to his advantage. Being a good-looking young man definitely had its peaks, and it aided his already powerful charisma, something that he made sure to flex often. His appearance was clean, well-kept, and very professional, all of which was extremely important when climbing a political ladder. There was even a time when a young Chief Palpatine worried for his complexion, which he spoke of with his master Plagueis during their training, and this is what he said in the Plagueis novelization. Sidious says, Will I eventually be physically transformed? To which Plagueis responds, Into some aged, pale skin, rapsy voice, yellow-eyed monster you mean. Such as the one you see before you, Plagueis gestured to himself. Let's pause the reading for a moment here. Plagueis has undergone physical transformations after he began delving into the dark side of the Force, and Palpatine was actually unsettled by this fact at first. Of course, since he was younger at this point, he still held onto the concerns of youthful things such as beauty. However, his mind would be forever changed by what Plagueis would say next. Surely you are acquainted with the lore, King Amen of Onderon. Darth Sion and Nihilus, but whether it will happen to you, I cannot say. Know this though, Sidious, that the power of the dark side does not debilitate the practitioner as much as it debilitates those who lack it. The power of the dark side is an illness no true Sith would ever wish to be cured of. It would seem that Sidious and Plagueis had both unintentionally predicted the fate of Sidious's iconic appearance, and it was good that they had this conversation, as it seemed that this advice given to Sidious by his master stuck with him until the inevitable day that he too was transformed. Let's now go on to the novelization for Revenge of the Sith, where we read what happens immediately after Sidious dubs Anakin Vader. Palpatine examinated the damage to his face in a broad expanse of a wall mirror. He lifted one tentative hand to his misshapen horror that he now saw in the mirror, then simply shrugged. And so the mask becomes the man. He sighed, sighed with a hint of philosophical melancholy. I shall miss the face of Palpatine, I think. But for our purpose, the face of Sidious will serve. Yes, it will serve well. When it finally happens, Palpatine's initial opinion at first is of sorrowful indifference. For him, it was simply how things panned out in the Great Plan, and if his face was the sacrifice, then so be it. He mentions that he might miss the face of Palpatine, but then he turns his entire situation to his advantage once again when he says that the face of Sidious will serve its purpose. We must pay careful attention to his wording here. Palpatine was considered once very handsome features, and this has always been a mask to him. The face and the facade was Palpatine the boy that died that day that he killed his entire family and swore himself to the darkness. He no longer cared for that face because it was the face of a man long dead. 
The shriveled horror that now was his physical appearance was what he regarded as the face of Sidious, his true face. The way that the scene is shot of Mace Windu using Sidious's lightning to deform him was more like Sidious's own dark power revealing who he truly was. So we might say that Sidious somewhat mourned for the face that had gotten him where he was, but now that that season of his life was over, and now it was time for the season of the Dark Lord. And the face would serve their purpose, just as the face of Palpatine did. Of course, what he means by this is that he will use this deformity to his advantage by wearing it as a permanent battle scar of his epic survival against the attempt on his life by the Jedi, which was the story he would tell the galaxy. His very face was living proof that the Jedi had tried to betray the Republic, so in that way, the appearance of Sidious would serve its ultimate purpose. You see, the Sith are able to let things go just like the Jedi do if it serves their plans. The Jedi let things go to encourage detachment and harmony. The Sith, though, lets things go when things get in their way, or slow them down, or if necessary, they sacrifice it. Darth Malgus had to give up taking revenge of a Jedi rival because of his girlfriend and because of the fact that she got in the way and was taken hostage. Afterwards, Malgus realized that his love had blinded him and Malgus killed her because she had become his weakness. In the same way, Palpatine had needed this to happen in order to convince Anakin and Windu that he was too weak to defend himself. This was what ultimately goaded Anakin to the darkness. In the heat of the battle against the Jedi, Palpatine's face had been the only real casualty in the effort to destroy his longtime rival. And for Sidious, this was no real casualty, and so he offered it freely. A perfect plan, perfectly representative of Darth Sidious. But at last, the Jedi were no more, and the galaxy was his to do as he pleased. Palpatine had brought about the grand plan, and now the Sith were in control of the entire galaxy. So if it was always the Sith's plan to rule over everything, then why did Palpatine continue to hide his identity as Darth Sidious? Greetings, curious acolytes of the Force, and welcome back to the Archives. Darth Sidious has succeeded in doing what no other Sith had done before him, and yet he didn't take the pleasure of ousting himself as a Sith to the public eye cluing them in on who truly ruled the galaxy yet again. Even though the Jedi already knew, the Republic could turn against the Jedi, and now Sidious was their emperor. His word was law, and no one could stand against him. But yet, Sidious kept his Darth title hidden and his Sith secrets to himself. But yet, despite doing this, Darth Vader was allowed to publicly acknowledge himself as a Sith Lord. So why exactly was this? Well, my friends, the answer is quite fascinating and is a testament to Sidious's genius. Not all is as it appears, and if you want to continue solving mysteries just like this one, be sure to reach out and force crush that subscribe button. It is your destiny. During the Clone Wars, Palpatine was forced to lead a double life in order to ensure the perfect continuation of the Sith plan, pulling the strings of the Republic as the Supreme Chancellor Palpatine, and then turning around to control the Separatists as the Dark Lord of the Sith. This being no easy task, nor was it in any way less stressful than it sounds. Palpatine was having to control two parties in a war while keeping his double life a secret. Having to rely on an inner circle of contacts was likely very risky, especially for Sidious, as he had put the entire fate of his plan in the hands of people, people such as Sly Moore and Masa Meta, both of whom knew of his double life and would regularly cover for him when he had to do business as Sidious. By the time of the rise of the Empire, it would have been the perfect opportunity for Sidious to finally throw off the shackles of the double life and finally be Sidious, no longer Palpatine. Sidious had decidedly exercised a great deal of self-control whenever he took over the Republic and reorganized it into the Galactic Empire. It was the Sith's great day of victory, and he would have had every right to gloat about it by finally dropping the facade of the vulnerable politician from Naboo, revealing out of the gate the most fearsome and powerful being in the galaxy, the most powerful Sith Lord since Valkorion. But yet, Palpatine wisely held back from doing so, continuing to be the unpowered Palpatine, just with more influence and control over the galaxy. In fact, Palpatine had actually made the plan to continue keeping his identity a secret for as long as the Empire could exist. Our source today comes from Sidious's chapter in the Book of the Sith, which is titled Absolute Power. In this section, he gives us a detailed account of exactly why he decided to retain his anonymity. The passage goes as follows. The galaxy is free from the Jedi, and the citizens rejoice. 
Therefore, it would be foolish to replace their regime with an identical system led by that of the Sith. At least publicly, the weak do not understand the Force. They venerate those who appear to be ordinary people like themselves. They cheered at the news that a resolute old man had survived a Jedi assassination attempt. In Palpatine, an ordinary senator from Naboo, they see a model of human achievement. It was an excellent stroke of genius that Palpatine decided to temper his pride and remain the way that he had always been perceived. If it was revealed that he was Force-sensitive, the people would have had much more unrest. As Palpatine pointed out, the average citizen does not comprehend the Force, they don't know, and probably don't care about the differences between a Jedi and a Sith. They fear those with supernatural powers, all the same. By his own hand, Palpatine had ensured that they did, ensuring that the average citizen would turn against the Jedi and oust them during the Purge. Not to mention, this would have completely diminished the impact of Palpatine's supposed survival after the assassination attempt by Windu, a moment that caused the galaxy to call Palpatine their truest hero. If he revealed himself to be the most powerful Sith Lord that had ever lived, that the scars that he now bore on his face, the one that he displayed and that represented his brave stance against the tyranny of the Jedi, would mean nothing. Palpatine did not need the powers of the Force to subjugate anyone. He was now the absolute authority, and there was no one left worthy of the knowledge that he was a Force wielder. But again, one major question remains. Why did Palpatine allow Vader to be publicly known as a Sith Lord? We are sure that knowledge of his strange powers were very public knowledge, as his rumors were widely known among the troopers of the Rebel Alliance. He also regularly displayed his powers in the Force among the Imperial military by constantly killing officers. Not to mention that high-ranking Imperials such as Grand Moff Tarkin actively point out in A New Hope that Vader is the last of the Jedi. Not only is Vader known as a Sith, but he was also known as a former Jedi to most. So why was this not forced to stay a secret as well? Luckily for us, Palpatine explains this too. My apprentice and other agents of my will are fearsome embodiments of the dark side. Mere rumors of their presence are enough to frighten citizens into obedience. But those same citizens must not know that a Sith Lord has constructed the Galactic Empire until the moment is too late. Vader's identity as a Sith Lord inspired much fear. Ruling by fear, according to Palpatine, was a fine line, a tightrope that threatened to snap at any moment. Palpatine needed to be an expert on psychological warfare, weakening the minds of their opponents without giving away their true secrets, much like the Sith ability of Dun Mok. Similar to this, Sidious points out that Dun Mok could quickly and easily backfire if one wasn't careful enough while using it, using it incorrectly or against the wrong person, and it could cause them to fly into a rage that would be difficult to quell. The same rules applied for ruling the galaxy. Palpatine must force the average citizen's hatred into a direction that is advantageous to him, while also ruling by fear. Large battleships and rumors of the leaders in the Imperial military that there is a Sith Lord in command. No knowledgeable citizen would ever try to rise up. Vader is the Emperor's dragon, his rancor if you will. If all goes well and you're a good citizen of the Empire, then there are no problems. But if you challenge him, you may find yourself in the rancor pit facing down a monster that you cannot comprehend, and a power that exceeds anything you have ever seen. Rumors of these monsters is what kept citizens loyal and kept their nightlights on, their blasters by their bedside. Fear of Vader even penetrates into the rebellion itself. And this, my friends, is the perfect balance that kept the Empire in power for two decades, only destroying the Emperor and his dragon would the Empire ever fall. But anyway, my friends and acolytes, this is why Sidious retained his identity as a normal human being, despite Vader not doing so. We the training of Darth Maul as a rule of two era Sith Lord was very unconventional when compared to the other Sith of his era. The rule of two Sith represented the culmination, when the Sith attempted to rise to power through what was established previously by Lord Bane, a master to covet and hold the power closely, and an apprentice to seek it out and eventually overthrow the master. With that said, Darth Maul was trained under mysterious circumstances, that being that two Sith Lords already existed in the Star Wars universe when Darth Maul 
Paul was taken as an apprentice. Those Sith were of course his own master in Sidious, and Sidious his master in Darth Plagueis. It was because of this that there were very strict rules and guidelines revolving around the training of Lord Maul as a third Sith of this era. Guidelines established by Darth Plagueis as essentially protection against Maul being trained as a fully formed Sith Lord that Sidious could use to overthrow him. In guidelines, they were even proven completely correct by Darth Maul's usage of a double-bladed lightsaber. A lightsaber that is purely identified as a Sith weapon in Star Wars Legends, created by the fallen Jedi Exar Kun and perfected. So, why did Darth Sidious actually want Darth Maul to use a double-bladed lightsaber? Why did he love this fact, and why did it put Darth Plagueis' mind at ease? What about Darth Maul's lightsaber, played perfectly into the full plan of the Sith, without Darth Maul being formally a rule of two era Sith Lord at all? And why did Darth Sidious actively encourage it? To begin, we have to look at the rule of two era Sith Lords, specifically Sidious and Plagueis, and their views on the lightsaber. Sidious and Plagueis shared a similar view, that being that a lightsaber was very much second to the powers of the Force. The Sith had grown past their usage, as the Sith of this era believed, as again they were scientists, politicians, and very influential figures throughout the galaxy. They obtained power through political prowess and prowess in the Force, not skill with the blade as they considered this to be a Jedi tradition. This is why, when Sidious trained Darth Maul to be perfect and to focus on lightsaber combat above the gifts of the Force, this is something that Plagueis was hugely supportive of. Beyond this though, this harkens even deeper to the use of Maul's double-bladed lightsaber, as it was Darth Sidious who provided Maul a holocron with detailed information on how to construct the perfect saber staff. As stated, in Legends continuity, the saber staff was an ancient Sith weapon developed by the Sith for the Sith. There was a certain brutality associated with the weapon, and again, this harkened directly into the training of Darth Maul. Darth Maul was trained to be a Sith, but something important that we need to note is he was not trained to be a rule of two Sith. Darth Maul was a Sith brute and a Sith assassin, a version of Sith that harkened back to the old masters when there were thousands upon thousands of Sith in the galaxy at a single time, a version that Sidious and Plagueis believed that they had evolved past and yet could still be very advantageous. The Sith of this time needed someone in the form of Maul to do their bidding from the shadows, an individual that could eventually reveal themselves as a Sith Lord without giving away the grand plan of Palpatine and Plagueis. Plagueis also made Darth Sidious swear that the plan of the Sith and their rise to the galaxy would not be shared with Maul. And Darth Maul was not trained in the tactics and machinations developed by Sidious and Plagueis, nor did he have access to the teachings of the ancient Sith as the rule of two Sith did. Instead, he focused heavily on lightsaber combat, and the double-bladed lightsaber played hugely in his favor. In addition to this, Maul chose to focus his lightsaber form on Form 7, Juyo, the most aggressive of all lightsaber combat forms. This is again a form that he chose after Palpatine explained to Darth Maul how it was hugely advantageous and was deeply indoctrinated into the lore of the Sith, as well as worked massively in his favor. In the Book of the Sith, Darth Sidious writes that Darth Maul was the clear embodiment of the ancient era Sith warrior, and therefore required a weapon that harkened back to this era as well. Sidious stated that the double-bladed lightsaber belonged to the barbarians of the ancient Sith order, which is exactly what he wanted to train in Maul. Sidious was also aware that Darth Maul would need to be in constant conflict with the Jedi as the face of the new Sith order, with Sidious and Plagueis hiding in the background, and he also believed that the double-bladed lightsaber would be hugely advantageous in these scenarios as well. The double-bladed lightsaber as noted by Darth Bane and later Darth Sidious himself didn't provide that many advantages in the heat of a lightsaber duel, with Darth Bane noting in his novel that it was exceptionally hard to master and could even be dangerous for the wielder. Darth Bane's own apprentice in Darth Zana also chose to utilize a dual-bladed lightsaber, but for very different reasons than Darth Maul did. Darth Sidious encouraged Darth Maul to perfect the double-bladed lightsaber because many Jedi, especially of the Clone Wars era, were exceedingly unfamiliar with the weapon, and it has seemingly gone extinct through their order, only utilized by the Jedi Temple Guards for more ceremonial purposes, as it is believed that they were not drilled with it and trained with it to the extent that they were a single-bladed lightsaber or other variations on the weapon. Therefore, when Darth Maul, who had perfected the dual-bladed lightsaber, came into conflict with a Jedi, they were caught off guard by his ferocity and the unfamiliar 
familiarity with his weapon. The first time that Darth Plagueis saw Darth Maul's dual-bladed lightsaber, he even directly commented to Sidious, stating that he now knew that Darth Maul was not trained as a true Rule of Two era apprentice, but because he wielded the lightsaber of the ancient era and the lightsaber that had once belonged to Exar Kun in fashion, he now realized that Darth Maul was purely trained as a warrior of the Sith and an assassin rather than a true full-blown apprentice. To Plagueis and Darth Sidious, the double-bladed lightsaber represented a lack of grace and a knowledge of the finer things in the Force. It represented many of the pitfalls of the ancient Sith, which is something that Darth Plagueis was hugely proud of Sidious for, in fact, as he implemented within his very apprentice the doctrine of the ancient Sith and the brutality of the double-bladed lightsaber, something that Darth Plagueis believed were the pitfalls of the ancient order and one of the many reasons why the Sith had to evolve, meaning that Darth Maul would never become a true rival to Plagueis and Sidious, just as Darth Plagueis desired, with Maul being more of a means to an end than anything else. In the end, though, this all worked perfectly in Sidious's advantage, as he never intended to keep Maul as his final apprentice, especially after Anakin Skywalker emerged, simply as a means to an end to achieve his goals. This is why it's always been so interesting to me in Star Wars lore that Darth Maul puts a huge emphasis on lightsaber combat, so much so that he neglects practicing in the dark side of the Force itself, where on the opposite end, his master couldn't be more different. Sidious only using a lightsaber to display his superiority over the Jedi, believing that the Sith had grown past its practice entirely, and that he now represented a better, more transformed version, an era of the Sith. But in the end, it all does make perfect sense. Darth Maul was never meant to ascend to the rank of a fully formed rule of two era Sith Lord. Even if there were only ever two Sith Lords in the galaxy at once, Maul was a means to an end, and so was his weapon. But anyway, my friends, what are your thoughts on this? And what are your thoughts on Darth Sidious's, well, complicated viewpoints on Darth Maul's double-bladed lightsaber? What are your thoughts on how it ultimately worked in his favor, but at the same time proved the inferiority of Maul. Also, the legacy of Darth Plagueis the Wise is far more wide-reaching and dubious than many might initially believe on the surface. While he has no physical presence throughout the era of the Clone Wars nor beyond, the products of his experiments and the legacy he left behind have continued to guide and influence the decisions made by even the most notorious Sith Lords following long after his death. So despite being the master of his master, one of the most powerful Darksiders ever, actually know about the individual who trained Darth Sidious. What did he think of this Elder Sith Acolyte, and how did the legacy of Darth Plagueis directly influence Darth Vader's life even beyond his seduction to the dark side and fall to the Sith? What were Darth Vader's thoughts on Plagueis' ability to create life, and the secrets that Darth Sidious would never teach him? Well today, students of the Force and Acolytes of the Galaxy, welcome back to another Holocron opening, and let's dive into what Vader knew about Darth Plagueis and some of the misconceptions that he had about his predecessor, which were later cleared up. The first time Vader hears the name of the Elder Sith, he is told the legend behind how he died shortly before succumbing to the power of the dark side. What's important to note here is that Darth Sidious never actually reveals that he is referring to his own master, and he frames the story as a Sith legend that has no discernible time frame. According to Palpatine's version of events, it could have theoretically taken place hundreds or even thousands of years ago, far before anyone in the modern galaxy has risen to prominence, and there was no reason for Anakin to ever suspect that this story might have taken place at the point in the Republic's era, or even recent history within his own lifetime. For all Anakin knew, Palpatine could have been referring to an ancient Sith Lord who may have not even existed at all, not referencing an event that happened less than 20 years ago right in the Jedi Order's own backyard of Coruscant, and this ambiguity was vital in Darth Sidious's plan to convert Anakin to an agent of evil. What this meant is that Anakin couldn't even be sure that Plague existed in the first place, and this might have been a myth peddled around for centuries by the Sith, losing truth and substantiated evidence as time went on. This helps to add a layer of mystery and intangibility, seeing if Anakin would take the bait and become curious enough of his own accord to verify what Palpatine had claimed. But as Anakin would come to find out, this legend was verifiably true. Palpatine needed Anakin to come to him for the answers, and telling him outright that this was a true story and a fact might have deterred Anakin from ever coming to him and becoming more curious. In between hearing the legend and turning to Darth Vader, Anakin had to learn to rely on fate 
debate, seeing as there were no concrete way of knowing whether or not this was truly a power that the dark side held. Given how the Jedi Order had pushed him further and further from the light, however, he began to see this legend as his only alternative. So then, did Darth Vader ever come to find out that Plagueis was not only real, but was the mentor to his very own master? Surprisingly enough, Darth Vader did in fact come to learn the full story of Darth Plagueis the Wise, but only after being entombed in his iconic life-preserving suit of Durasteel armor. After giving himself over to the dark side, Darth Sidious was far more open to expanding Vader's teachings and knowledge, allowing him to learn more about his own past and his own training as their lessons continued in the early days of the Empire. Although this is not to suggest that Darth Sidious was not still secretive with his apprentice. As Vader served and trained under the Emperor, however, he learned about the full story, even leaving him to wonder if Sidious might have learned this ability from himself. We can see this in the finale of the latest Darth Vader comic run, published by Marvel Comics and expanding the new Disney canon. In the final issue, Vader experiences a Force vision wherein Palpatine is standing behind an already pregnant Shmi Skywalker, reciting a variation of what was said in Revenge of the Sith. While many have taken this to mean that Palpatine is Anakin's father, this was not confirmed, and many have been taking this as a metaphorical interpretation, as is normal within Force Vision. What it did do, however, was get Vader to question whether or not Palpatine had learned the secret to manifesting life itself by using the Force, and what that might mean for his future as a Sith Lord. This meant that the Sith could potentially artificially create armies of Force-sensitive individuals, thrusting the galaxy into absolute chaos, and ripping the fabric of civilization to shreds. It also meant that Palpatine might have actually cracked the secret to immortality, which became evident in the rise of Skywalker. As far as Vader's own personal motivations, however, he did not have any more reason to seek the power of immortality or to learn how to manipulate the life forces of living creatures. His only motivation now was to save the life of his late wife, Padme and now that she was gone, he had no inclination to learn the secret to immortality. He certainly would not have used it on himself, as he was one of the most miserable individuals in the galaxy, living in constant physical and mental agony, only exacerbated by the loss of everything he had ever loved. Vader eventually and truly wanted to die. For most of his time as a Sith Lord, he couldn't ever be 100% sure that Plagueis had actually learned the secret to immortality, but he also couldn't be certain that Palpatine wasn't lying either. This put Vader in a precarious position between belief and doubt, prodding his already secretive master as to whether or not he could truly manipulate the life forces by using the midichlorians. His vision at the end of this comic run, however, only served to deepen his confusion and muddy his already unclear take on the situation. His vision seemed to indicate that he was truly the product of immaculate conception via the way of the Force, and furthermore, that Palpatine himself may have been responsible, hinting to Vader that either Plagueis had figured it out, or had made enough progress for Palpatine to finish his late master's research and finally achieve his goal. In Legends continuity, it is revealed that Darth Sidious has told Vader extremely little about Darth Plagueis, with Darth Vader becoming more obsessed with other aspects of the Force and the galaxy around him, such as dominating the Jedi and becoming as powerful as possible, hunting down his former masters in Yoda, but more specifically, Obi-Wan Kenobi, and that for nearly two decades, Darth Vader has been told extremely little about Darth Plagueis. However, he does know that he was in fact the master of Sidious. It is also revealed that Darth Sidious spoke little of Plagueis to his other apprentices, including Maul as well as Duke. Dooku, who did know that Darth Plagueis was his former master, but other than that, knew next to nothing. It was also confirmed, though, that Darth Sidious never revealed the writings of Darth Plagueis in the Book of the Sith to Darth Vader, perhaps because he wanted to keep as much knowledge for himself, or perhaps because Darth Sidious believed that this knowledge was not worthy for Darth Vader's eyes. Darth Sidious never desired for Vader or Dooku to ever be his replacement. Therefore, he did not see it necessary to share any more of the legend or tale of Darth Plagueis with either of them, keeping all of his master's learnings and advancements in the Force to himself. But anyway, my friends, what are your thoughts on this? And what are your thoughts on Darth Vader's thoughts on Darth Plagueis? And the fact that following the events of Revenge of the Sith, Darth Vader never really learns anything beyond Darth Plagueis and never really even pursues immortality following the death of Padme. Did Greetings, students of the Force, and welcome back to the channel. The complicated and rather strained relationship between Darth Vader and his Emperor is very often seen each time they interact with one another. This idea is further explored in many of the comics, where we see 
see just how Palpatine really treats Vader and their rather abusive relationship that results from it. But for today's video, we wanted to look at a specific part of their relationship and have a more casual discussion on this topic, just sort of opening a dialogue about the complex and complicated nature between these two massively powerful Sith Lords. Now, officers, grab a drink and relax as we discuss the state of affairs of our Empire's leadership. We invite you to comment below and to add to this video with your own thoughts. Now, let us begin. Undoubtedly, Palpatine is a master manipulator and always has been, which is how he was able to seduce Anakin and turn him to the dark side in the first place. However, there is a drastic change in the relationship between Chancellor Palpatine and Anakin and the Emperor and Lord Vader. It is evident that they seem to carry a certain amount of tension with one another when they interact, and it all starts with the very moment after Vader wakes from being put in his suit and his failures on Mustafar. In the 2017 Vader comic run, Vader immediately reaches out and thrusts Sidious to the wall with the Force, condemning him by telling Sidious that he had promised him that nothing would happen to Padme and that she could in fact be saved. Sidious, though, talked down to him, explaining that she had given him the gift of pain and that he could then use this pain to augment his power and grow stronger, choosing life or to choose death. Squander the final gift of Padme. After Vader let Sidious down, Sidious punished him by unleashing a torrent of force lightning and saying that if Vader ever touched him with the force again, that he would finish what Kenobi could not. Sidious then let him up and said that he would hope that they were his friends. Friends that could put this all behind them and look forward to the future. However, from this moment on, they began their new relationship as Sith, with a new understanding between them. Gone were the days of Palpatine being the father figure Anakin so desperately desired. Now, he was his master and lord, and their friendship would be entirely different one of mistrust, skepticism, and abuse. What's important about their relationship is Palpatine presented himself to Vader in a couple of different ways, depending on what he needed from him at any given moment. Sometimes he appeared to him in holograms as his emperor and commander-in-chief, speaking to Vader as a general would to a subordinate. Other times, Sidious would come to Vader as if he were his teacher and his Sith master, offering him advice whenever it seemed Vader needed it, as well as being something of a disappointed parent by being sharp or curt with him. And even more often, Sidious would come to his apprentice, calling him friend, and speaking as if they were two of a kind against the galaxy. This fluctuation in how Sidious approached Vader was what Sidious had assumed would keep him in line, continuing to manipulate him even now. But what I find interesting is how Vader responds to all of this and his master's changing behavior. Unlike his master, who wears many faces when speaking to his apprentice, Vader responds to each situation exactly the same. Cold, quiet, rarely asking questions, and always responding with a simple, yes, my master. It seems as though Vader is quite aware of what his master is actively doing here and refuses to indulge him in any games. I think this is another point of tension for these two Sith Lords, as Vader is the only person Palpatine can't influence the emotions of any further. Vader, in a sense, has learned his lesson, but that doesn't mean that Darth Sidious doesn't enjoy doing so or won't attempt it anyway. As we go a little bit further, you will see that when he calls him friend, this is actually deeply insulting insulting, and is even more pouring salt in a wound of Darth Vader, a wound that Darth Vader will never heal. Sure, Darth Sidious can order Vader around and punish him as he pleases, but Sidious seems frustrated that Vader responds exactly the same way to every persona, every persona that Sidious uses on his apprentice, specifically though, their friendship, or at least as Sidious refers to it as friendship we do get an idea of what Vader thinks whenever he calls him friend. Vader knows that it's not only just a simple act, but also a form of insult. Vader understood where the two stand in their relationship from day one. As soon as he got within his suit, he realized what he had done, and realized the father-son connection and relationship established between Anakin and Chancellor Palpatine never existed in the first place. He understood the lying and the ultimate price of the dark side. Sidious knows that Darth Vader sees through all the manipulation manipulations, but continues to do it anyway just because he can, and he enjoys insulting Vader for all of his failures. He doesn't do it overtly unless he feels the need to, but more often, he is extremely passive-aggressive 
offering backhanded compliments and treating Vader more like a pet than anything else. And because of Vader's power level, he isn't able to really do anything about it. Sidious seems to only call him friend as a form of irony to symbolize that Vader has fallen so far, and just how far above him that the Emperor truly is. Make no mistake, Sidious is the absolute tormentor of Darth Vader, and the only reason that Darth Vader stays with Emperor Palpatine, his abuser, is the same reason that many in the real world stay with their abusers, because they believe that it is all they have. Darth Vader even personally explained that he only aligned with the Empire and the Sith after the death of Padme and the collapse of the Jedi Order, because that is all he had left. All he had left was Sidious's empire, an empire of ruin that Vader caused. And as his master, Sidious had achieved a state of power that Vader can now only dream of. And even though Vader uncovers plot after plot of Sidious trying to replace him, Vader thwarts it every single time. Vader may not be able to overthrow his master alone, but he can still be a thorn in his side and send Sidious a message saying that he isn't going anywhere. Which again ironically, is exactly what Darth Sidious wants. But that is why whenever Sidious refers to Darth Vader as his friend, it is actually the greatest insult that he can levy at Vader. Vader knows of his failure. He knows that his master is aware of it, but it is when his master treats him as an equal, even though he is fully aware that he is not, is where the true insults begin, and the wound stings fresh. But Darth Sidious was the ultimate culmination of the rule of two, and in some way, the culmination of the Sith Order themselves. However, in the Revenge of the Sith novelization, in the same opera scene in Revenge of the Sith, Darth Sidious has a fateful admittance about his order. As Darth Sidious divulges to Anakin Skywalker what he believes to be the true and ultimate weakness of the Sith. Greetings again, curious acolytes of the Force, and welcome back to the Archives. Among Sith Lords of the past, perhaps there has never been a Sith more zealous for the Dark Side than Sidious. Chief Palpatine was a man who grew to witness the power of the Dark Side firsthand, and would sell himself to it completely in order to harness its power, along with the knowledge of every past Sith Lord in order to become the Emperor of a new galaxy. And while he was at it, he accomplished what none of his predecessors could, destroy the Jedi. We are all aware of Sidious' sheer hatred for the Jedi, mostly because of how their hypocritical stance in the galaxy differs from his own. He could see that they loved power just as much as the Sith did, but that they refused to acknowledge that fact or use their powers to subjugate the galaxy and rule such as gods. Because of this contempt for the Jedi, he often placed the Sith Order as superior in every single way except for one. There was a single time when Darth Sidious conceded to one truth, the truth that the Sith and the Jedi both shared a particular weakness. So, come along with us today, Acolytes of the Force, as we open up yet another holocron and listen to what Sidious himself said was the only weakness of the Sith Order. This knowledge comes to us again thanks to the Revenge of the Sith novelization, which we've been taking a deep dive into recently. This conversation is when Palpatine is having a bit of a philosophical discussion with Anakin about the nature of the Jedi and the Sith. This is an expanded version of their talk during the ballet, right before the Chancellor decides to tell the young Jedi about the tragedy of Plagueis the Wise, one of the most important moments in all of Star Wars. In this conversation, Palpatine is carefully explaining to Anakin what the Sith actually believe, and how they are honestly not too much different from the Jedi besides from the fundamental fork in the road that is the light versus the dark. In this conversation, he is also playing on Anakin's feelings about the current political state of things, as the Senate seemingly is going nowhere with ending the war, despite Count Dooku's death. Palpatine gives Anakin a piece of advice, which he calls the first rule of politics, which is as follows. All who gain power are afraid to lose it. The two of them start getting into somewhat of a debate as to the motives of the Jedi and the Sith and how they contrast one another. Anakin does his best to recite the doctrine of his training and what he had been told all of his life growing up in the walls of the temple, but Palpatine manages to shoot down his arguments one after the other. The entire crux of their argument that Palpatine is trying to prove is that the Jedi relax in a seat of power over the entire galaxy and that it is only a matter of time before they begin to use that seat of power for their own well-being. 
This is huge for Palpatine and Anakin, as Palpatine is showing his skills as a politician as well as a debater and a manipulator, doing so by using the classic debate tactic of trying to use one common denominator in order to bring the other person over to your perspective and beliefs. In doing so, Sidious finally reveals to us what he believes the weakness of the Sith is by dropping this bombshell on Skywalker. The fear of losing power is a weakness of both the Jedi and the Sith. While it's an interesting topic all on its own that Palpatine believes the Jedi and Sith share this same weakness, we know that this was more of a manipulation tactic for Anakin when concerning the Jedi side of things. However, the Sith side of this argument can and has actually been proven as verifiably true. Darth Sidious is the culmination of the teachings of all of the past Sith Lords in galactic history. One of his favorite hobbies was to collect dark side artifacts and ancient Sith tomes and items which he had squirreled away in a hidden vault. Sidious had studied the ancient Sith Lords extensively and likely knew the lives of each and every one of them very well. Despite his master Darth Plagueis never really teaching Sidious anything about the ancients, Palpatine took it upon himself to learn everything he could about them, and for very good reason. In his research, he would be searching for at first ancient, long forgotten knowledge of the dark side, but in the process, he would of course learn about the cause of the demise of all of these powerful men and women who served the darkness. The backstabbing nature of the Sith did play a part in it, sure, but that was the reason that the rule of two existed, to capitalize on betrayal, which is what the Sith do best. This wasn't the weakness that Sidious saw, but rather saw this as a strength. We all know that Sidious only loosely followed the rule of two, and had several assassins and thralls which he backstabbed all the time when they outlived their usefulness. So to Sidious, this was not a weakness so long as he was staying ahead. But interesting, he states that it is the fear of losing power which caught the eye of Sidious during his studies. And for our own purposes, we can cite the story of Darth and Dedu as being a prime example of this fear. There is such a thing as being too powerful. This is due to the fact that with most people, especially those in the dark side, when they grow exponentially in powers, so too do they grow in fear. When one becomes so powerful that they are nearly a god, then how do they cope with the idea that one day they can lose this all in an instant? Problem is, most don't, especially not Darth and Dedu, as this thought corrupted and changed him. For those of you who remember, Endedu was not only the first person to use the Darth title, but also the person who discovered the secret to immortality, which of course is the ability of essence transfer, also known as dark transfer. Endedu was a Sith Lord who pioneered many spells and rituals in the dark side and would write many scrolls and tomes in his lifetime. Though he was by far the most powerful Sith of his age, he grew paranoid, afraid that his followers were plotting against him. This fear turned out to be true, and he got the jump on his followers by faking his death and fleeing to his homeworld of Prakken. There, Andadu would set up his new empire and become the immortal god king of the world. However, again, his paranoia would catch up to him as he was always terrified that his followers would find him, kill him, seize his knowledge, and his throne as their own. This, though, was an illogical fear because not only had the hyperspace lane to Prakken close shortly after his arrival, but it had already been several hundred years since he fled the Sith Empire, and his followers would have largely died out. Despite this though, just as Sidious said, and Dedu would lock himself with his knowledge inside of a stronghold and eventually die, fearing to lose this power. Perhaps if he had been more brave, he could have reached the entire galaxy with his might. Instead though, he became so much less. Fearing betrayal, he locked himself away, so terrified at losing the power that he gained, and therefore did nothing with it. In the end, much better and more powerful men found out his knowledge and used it for great things, such as Lord Bane and the Baneite lineage. Sidious may have been afraid to lose his power, but he was not so afraid to allow it to cripple him and make him weak like Endedu even though, at moments, he likely would have liked to hide away. Perhaps Sidious actively fighting against what he called the only weakness of the Sith. But anyway, the fear of losing power is something that is a constant stumbling block for the Sith, and one that Sidious knew of. And who could blame them? The minute that one let their guard down, 
his fear was recognized. This, of course, would be Darth Plagueis, who made the mistake of putting far too much trust in an apprentice and allowing himself to become vulnerable enough around Sidious, which ultimately got him killed. So how was it that Yoda actually tricked Darth Sidious in their final fight, and in the process saved the life of Obi-Wan Kenobi? Greetings, Acolytes, and welcome back to the Archives. In the moments before Darth Vader's mutilation, Sidious comments that he senses that Lord Vader was in danger, prompting him to immediately prep his shuttle for immediate takeoff to Mustafar. This disturbance of the dark side was actually not the first time that Palpatine had a bad feeling about Anakin, though, in his venture to Mustafar. As we learn in the Revenge of the Sith novelization, he actually had an inkling that Anakin was in danger before this. In fact, it occurred right before Padbe's ship had ever landed on the volcanic world. Sidious warned his apprentice that he sensed a great danger, but then Palpatine quickly dismissed that danger following, leaving Anakin alone to face Obi-Wan. But why exactly did Palpatine dismiss his premonition of danger for Anakin in the first place? And how was it that Yoda was the one who ultimately tricked Palpatine into doing so? Well, my friends, let's open up another holocron and find out one of the fatal mistakes of Darth Sidious at the dawn of his empire. Before we begin, however, we know that you are not so prone to trickery, but there are more mysteries that need to be revealed about a galaxy far, far away. So, in order to find them, be sure to hit that subscribe button so that you may increase your knowledge of the Force and more. Now, let us begin. This event occurs during the hollow transmission that Vader and Palpatine were having moments before Padme's arrival to Mustafar. When her ship entered atmosphere, secretly carrying Obi-Wan, the Emperor's alarm bells started going off. Sidious immediately warned Vader that he believed that he was in danger and that he needed to be very careful. Anakin saw the ship on the control room sensors and immediately recognized who it was. This caused Anakin to completely disregard his master's warning, stating in his mind, yeah, in danger of being kissed to death, maybe. After this, their transmission ended, and Anakin went off to greet Padme. But back on Coruscant, Palpatine swiveled his chair to see Grandmaster Yoda entering his office. His physical presence meant nothing. Palpatine only cared for his presence in the Force. He was a fountain of light. It was Yoda's exact presence in this very moment that likely made Palpatine rethink his earlier concerns for Vader. In this moment, Sidious was tricked into believing the danger he sensed was not for Darth Vader, but it was for Yoda. His suspicion was confirmed, at least to himself, after learning from Yoda that it was Obi-Wan who was sent to stop Anakin. To this thought, Palpatine thought amusing, as he believed of anyone, Obi-Wan was the least likely to be able to stop Vader. Palpatine thought Obi-Wan was weak and inferior as it stood, and he mentioned that Vader would take pleasure in crushing him just for the fun of it. When Sidious came to this conclusion, he let his guard down, not in front of Yoda, mind you, but he let his guard down concerning Obi-Wan and Vader in the coming confrontation. Letting go of that thought, he focused entirely on the green creature in his office. The thing about Sidious is that he is always future-minded, in direct contrast to the Jedi who emphasize being present and mindful of the moment. Sidious, though, is ever thinking of the future, always planning, and always looking beyond the horizon with his clairvoyance. Sidious was renowned for his ability of foresight, and there were very few things that escaped Sidious's notice unless they are strong enough to be hidden somehow. But this is likely what Yoda did in this moment, by forcing Palpatine's attention to where he was, rather than where his apprentice was. The Grand Master needed to buy Obi-Wan as much time as possible. He couldn't risk the Emperor sending reinforcements to Vader. Our theory is that Obi-Wan made sure to contact Yoda and tell the Grand Master when he was in the position to engage Darth Vader. While Kenobi had to wait for them to travel all the way from Coruscant to Mustafar, all Yoda needed to do was catch a ride from Bail Organa. We know canonically that Yoda and Obi-Wan engaged the Sith at the exact same time, so Yoda obviously waited for Kenobi's confirmation and then entered the Senate building. The reason for this, if Sidious believed that he felt a disturbance, it would be for Yoda and not for Vader. This is the exact reason why Yoda allowed Sidious to know Obi-Wan was the one facing down Darth Vader. So Sidious's overconfidence in his apprentice would further the deception. But now, Yoda has finally tricked the Emperor and caused him to draw all of his attention to the present moment, forcing him to take his clairvoyant eye away from Vader for the duration of his duel with Yoda. 
Of course though, this is not to say that this was Yoda's only mission, as he had every intention of killing Sidious in this duel. However, one of the tertiary goals was ensuring that Palpatine wasn't able to sense Vader's endangerment from Kenobi until the final moment. It is our theory that Obi-Wan Kenobi was supposed to strike down Darth Vader before Yoda was to kill Sidious, and with the death of his apprentice, Sidious would feel a massive disturbance in the Force that would distract him momentarily, drawing his focus away from Yoda and to Vader, giving Yoda the perfect opportunity to strike the fatal blow. A lapse in concentration is all that Yoda needed, but Yoda didn't anticipate two things, how powerful Sidious actually was, and how long it would take Kenobi to defeat Skywalker. In the novelization, it states that Yoda was absolutely horrified by just how powerful Sidious actually was, and stated that he could have imagined something terrible, but not as terrible as Sidious. Yoda even states that he's fighting a duel against the Dark Lord that the Jedi have already lost. They had lost for thousands of years at this point, and they lost the moment that the Sith transformed into the Rule of Two. The Sith had completely changed, and it wasn't lightsabers that could solve this problem. Because of this, the tables had completely switched against Yoda, and he was unable to defeat Sidious how he thought he might have. And this is why Yoda stated to Bail Organa that he failed the Jedi. Yoda even believed that since he had failed against Sidious, that Obi-Wan would fail too, and that Vader would soon kill him. However, it was only after all the fighting had calmed that Sidious finally realized that Vader was in danger, not himself, springing to action and only taking a few minutes for Palpatine to arrive on Mustafar. However, Obi-Wan had already defeated Anakin and left him for dead. Sidious' worst fears were realized when he saw his half-dead apprentice lying in ruin on the Black Beach. Yoda's plan of deception had actually worked, but things just didn't go the way the whole plan had been envisioned. The Jedi just couldn't win this one. He could defeat Sidious, and yet the Jedi would still never return. The Jedi had lost already. The galaxy had turned against all of them, and Darth Vader was still alive. And yet, Yoda had stopped the worst part of Darth Vader being inflicted on the galaxy by stalling Sidious. This way, he had to ensure Vader's handicap, which gave a slight glimmer of hope by depriving Sidious of his grand prize. Greetings Acolytes of the Force, and welcome back to the channel. Earlier, we did a video explaining the different Councils of the Jedi Order, as well as their functions. In that video, we mentioned that the Council of Reconciliation would pass judgment over those Jedi who had broken certain rules, committed a crime, or fallen to the dark side entirely. This posed an interesting question though. What was Jedi Protocol, and what would happen to a Jedi who turned to the dark side? What was Protocol like when the Council was aware of a Jedi that had fallen to the dark side? And how did they deal with such an event? It only makes sense that they would have many systems in place for dealing with such an issue, as great many Sith of galactic history were in fact fallen Jedi, and the rebirth of the Sith Order that came from Exar Kun, and later Darth Malak and Revan, were all results of the Jedi. Even the very first Dark Jedi who pioneered the Sith religion as we know it, Ajunta Pal, as well as his disciples, were again Jedi to begin with. So, knowing this, we wanted to take a deep look at what the systems are for punishing these Dark Jedi and Jedi that fell to the dark side of the Force. First though, according to our analytics, a lot of you that watch the channel haven't actually subscribed yet, so if you want to stay up to date with everything Star Wars lore related and news, Force crush that subscribe button. Now Acolytes, let us answer the question. As we know, first the allegations would have to be proven before the High Council before they began moving forward. There would be a period of investigation upon discovery, or probable cause. They would then need to arrest the Jedi in question and hold court with the Council of Reconciliation. During this hearing, Jedi accused would stand trial against the Council, and any witnesses or advocates of the accuser were allowed to come forward with any testimonies that would clear their name of their Jedi brethren, or condemn them entirely. This of course though, is assuming that the affair was only internal, and that the Jedi had been accused of practicing dark side teachings. Had the Jedi committed some sort of other heinous act or crime, such as the case of Barriss Offee during the Clone Wars, would she bomb the Jedi Temple and ultimately frame Ahsoka? This was considered far more serious. In this case, they would entirely bypass the Council of Reconciliation and would be taken before the High Courts of the Galactic Senate, 
with the Jedi Council as the effective jury. The Jedi High Council, that is, not the Council of Reconciliation. The thing about this is, the accused Jedi can only be taken before Republic courts if they have committed a crime or acts of terrorism. The act of simply studying the dark side or being a Sith in itself is not necessarily illegal as stated in the Star Wars novelizations when Mace Windu accused Palpatine of being a Sith Lord. In the novel for Revenge of the Sith, the dealings between Mace Windu and Palpatine are gone much more in depth than in the films. He didn't attack them at first but continued to play coy, with Palpatine hoping that he could lower the defenses of the Jedi, as well as use the office hollow security cameras to make sure the Jedi looked as bad as possible. In the scene, Mace Windu announces that Palpatine is a Sith Lord. Palpatine responds with the following though, Am I? Even if I were, this isn't of any concern. As I believe, there are constituents in place to protect freedom of religion from persecution. By Republic law, it isn't illegal to simply be a Sith like it used to be. Around the time of 3959 BBY, Revan and Malak rose to power and started the Jedi Civil War, in which they brought back the Sith Empire once again to terrorize the Republic. This was the final straw after centuries of conflict with the Sith. In response to the brutal predations of Revan and Malak, as well as their followers, the Galactic Senate of the Republic drafted a bill that was intended to outlaw the practice of the Sith philosophy. The bill was ultimately approved and put into effect, making it illegal from that point onward to establish or be a member of a Sith organization, or even partake in the advancement of Sith teachings. The bill remained in effect for the next 3,000 years, with the Senate maintaining its legal stance against the Sith throughout the Great Galactic War, the Cold War, and the New Sith Wars. In a conflict called the Light and Darkness War, the Republic military was in need of new recruits to continue their fight against the Sith Empire, who, were at the time organized into the Brotherhood of Darkness. Republic recruiters used the anti-Sith legislation of 3,000 years prior to justify their fight against the Brotherhood, as well as to explain their stance on the Jedi conflict. Essentially, if the Jedi had committed a crime in the name of the Dark Side, then they would be tried and imprisoned according to Republic law. However, if they were found to be studying the Dark Side and proven guilty by the Council of Reconciliation, the Jedi would be stripped of their rank, title, and lightsaber before being exposed expelled from the Jedi Order. This was the protocol for the Clone Wars era. Back in the day when the Sith were most prevalent, it was believed to be easy to say that the Jedi Order might feel led to outright execute and accuse them before they became a bigger problem by sharing secrets of the Jedi to the enemies. But based on normal Republic law, during the era of the Clone Wars, it was not explicitly illegal for anyone to be a Sith Lord. And therefore, that is why Palpatine says to Mace Windu that it is not against any Republic code for him to be a Sith Lord, even though though it would have been illegal at one point in time in Star Wars Mytho. Most often though, studying the dark side of the Force and continuing an illegal activity went hand in hand for those Jedi that ultimately would fall to the dark side. In the era of the Clone Wars though, especially before the Clone Wars broke out, the Jedi Order was so dogmatic and so strict that it was actually very rare for a Jedi to fall to the dark side, especially Jedi of any significance. That is why when Dooku fell to the dark side of the Force, Mace Windu was so amazed that this was even possible, even though Dooku made it clear, and thanks to various canon novels, that he had been practicing the dark side of the Force for many years. Essentially though, if they had not broken any major laws by practicing the dark side of the Force, the worst that the Jedi could do was expulsion, if of course they could not ultimately sway them back to the light side of the Force, and convert them back to the path of the light, as of course the Jedi, especially the Council of Reconciliation, attempted to do just that first. Reconcile with the Jedi that fell to the dark side. However, if they had committed a crime, again it would go directly to the Jedi High Council and was considered far more serious. With little to no chance of reconciliation with the Jedi Order and near definite prison time if they were not proved innocent. But anyway, Acolytes of the Force, what are your thoughts on this? What are your thoughts on the Jedi procedure and protocol if somebody were to embrace the dark side of the Force or study dark side teaching? What are your thoughts on why it was ultimately not illegal for somebody to be a Sith? Lord, yet why the Jedi would expel them from the Order. Do you think that during the era of the Clone Wars, this bill should have continued and it still should have been illegal to be a Sith Lord? And do you think that this would have solved many problems for the Jedi? Or was Palpatine's secret simply too well hidden? As the Book of the Sith and Part 1, The Book of Anger was authored by Darth Sidious after his full ascension as the One Dark Lord, an Emperor of the entire galaxy. 
the culmination of the rule of two Bainite era and the culmination of the Sith as an entirety. In this, he writes, The writings of Darth Malgus confirm that anger, combined with will, is the key to power. When anger intensifies to rage, it is unstoppable. Malgus submitted utterly to the dark side. Of all of the ancient Sith, there was one Dark Lord that Sidious admired above all others, a pure acolyte of the dark side of the Force itself, a warrior, an intelligent mastermind, a broken demon, a man who was the author of the dark side itself, a pure avatar of it, similar to Sidious himself. That man was of course Darth Malgus. But what exactly was it about Malgus that Darth Sidious deemed so important? And what ancient writings did he acquire from Darth Malgus that he would later submit to Darth Vader? In Sidious's mind, believing that if Vader could simply be a fraction of what Malgus was, that Vader himself could be unstoppable. Greetings, acolytes of the Force, and students of the galaxy back to our expansive archives. We've been expecting you. And today, we will analyze why Darth Sidious deemed Darth Darth Malgus the most important and enlightened of any ancient Sith Lord. Before we begin though, we have received a terrible vision that some of the students that pass through our archives have not yet subscribed to our order, so if you yourself have not, reach out and force crush that subscribe button. It is your destiny. Now, Acolytes, let us begin. It was Darth Sidious's goal to be a student of every Sith Lord that he could get his hands on, all of their writings, all of their holocrons, and the very things that they stood for. As the culmination of the Sith, Darth Sidious believed this to be his true duty. What was unique about Darth Sidious, though, is he did not want to learn about the Sith from the words of historians. He needed first-hand knowledge, and he would come across one of his favorite Sith in the form of Darth Malgus on the Black Market. On the Black Market, Darth Sidious was able to secretly purchase Darth Malgus's very journal, a journal that Sidious found more enlightening than most of the holocrons of the ancients. The greatest thing that Darth Sidious claims to have uncovered from the journals of Malgus is Malgus's views on anger. It was Malgus's belief that it was anger that drew upon the pure extent of the dark side, rather than suffering or sadness. And Darth Malgus was a true master of anger. Malgus explained in the journal that as the Great Galactic War raged on, he was subsequently filled with more and more anger, especially following his defeat at the hands of the Republic and Satil Shan on the world of Alderaan, something that resulted in his permanent use of a respirator as well as minor cybernetic enhancements, quite similar to that of Sidious's own apprentice in Vader, which we will touch on a little bit later and the deep connection that the two share, as well as why Malgus may have actually been the superior in using his anger and his suffering to Vader, something that Sidious wished to impart on the former Jedi Chosen One. Malgus details individual conflicts and how he grew more and more angry that he had lost to Satil, but he leaned into the suffering and the anger that his injuries imparted upon him, and Malgus discovered something sensational. He grew more and more powerful the more injured and battered he became, not simply due to the sufferings imparted from the injuries themselves, but the anger that he felt from his losses. It was this ability that Malgus found in anger that Darth Sidious would actually attempt to structure the entire empire around. Let me explain. Malgus stated that he found with anger is where his greatest power in the dark side lie, and Sidious believed this as well. Sidious wrote and came to the conclusion that if he could structure the empire around hatred and anger for others, then he himself would grow to a level in the dark side where he would be unmatched, as well as would exploit the raw weaknesses within his lesser enemies. If Sidious conducted his empire in the most brutal way possible, he would rule unquestioned. And in the end, Darth Malgus was absolutely correct as it would be this lack of anger that would cause Vader to turn against Sidious, thus destroying the empire that he had built. But what's even more telling about this is the fact that Darth Sidious gifted the very journal of Malgus, one of his most prized possessions, to his apprentice and Lord Vader, believing that Malgus had much to teach Darth Vader, realizing that the two men were very similar on levels beyond simply being injured. He hoped in some sick, deranged way that the very direct words of Malgus would somehow inspire Vader Vader to become greater. Sidious believed that to Vader, Malgus could be the perfect example of somebody that lost a crucial engagement, with Vader and Obi-Wan Kenobi being the backbone of this, and yet how this Sith Lord could use his wounds and the anger that he felt to enhance his rage and therefore his very powers. As Sidious explained to Vader in the very pages of the Book of the Sith, it was Darth Malgus's increase in power following a massive defeat that he believed was applicable to Vader, and for nearly two decades, Vader 
Vader would take these words to heart, leaning into his ultimate failure with Obi-Wan Kenobi. This echoes directly in the fact that Vader even chose to construct his castle on the very world where he lost that duel. And even more than this, at a very location where he could overlook the exact lava bank that took his leg and arm. Sidious wanted this to be the very background of Darth Vader as well. The fact that he lost should serve as the backbone of his very power. However, there was one aspect of the journal that was meant to resonate with Vader beyond anything physical, that being that Malgus had a lover who he intended to spend his life with, a former Twi'lek slave by the name of Ania Daru, who Darth Malgus proclaimed his love for, and at various campaigns over the course of the Great Galactic War he was separated from. He even writes in his journal how he longed to be with this person. The same things that Darth Vader would later feel for Padme Amidala. Darth Vader even notes specifically in the Book of the Sith, which he does very, very rarely I may add, that he sought to find the ultimate fate of Darth Malgus's lover, a woman who he cared for so deeply, and a woman who he vowed to spend the rest of his life with after the Sith claimed the galaxy, stating in the journal that not even the Emperor of the Sith could deny him that. What's interesting about this journal that belonged to Darth Malgus is he never actually explicitly states what happened to this woman. However, over here in our archives, and in our order, we do believe that Darth Vader eventually found out the exact fate of Malgus's lover. That fate was that Malgus realized that in order to become more powerful, he had to take from him what he cared most. It was by the very hand of Malgus that Ania was killed. Darth Malgus decided to rid this, as not only did he view this as weakness, but he also believed that the anger that the dark side would grant him would cause him to be unmatched. A reality which was true, and a reality that clearly Darth Vader could sympathize with. The key difference here, though, is it was not Vader's choice to kill Amidala, when Darth Malgus very much decided by his own hand that she would die. This was meant to express to Vader that perhaps the death of his wife could serve as an advantage. Perhaps he could grow even more powerful now that Padme was gone. This would also teach Darth Vader that Malgus served the dark side and power above anything else, beyond his own attachments and beyond his own happiness even. Lines and truths that Darth Sidious hoped that Vader would also follow to a T. In all reality, Darth Vader did follow the teachings of Darth Malgus for nearly 20 years. He nearly became the true successor of Malgus, wielding his hatred like a bomb, and like a fury that was unmatched by any Sith Lord, and definitely any other individual of his era. We find it quite intriguing over at our archives that the same individual in Darth Malgus would bring so much insight into both the culmination of the Rule of Two in Vader and Sidious, and it was Malgus more than any other Sith Lord that the both of them were so inspired by even Sidious a bit more than Vader was. In many ways, you could see that Sidious considered Malgus to be the truest Sith Lord that ever existed, a man so dedicated to power that he valued it above anything else, even himself. But why was Palpatine actually glad that Anakin Skywalker had a cybernetic arm? Greetings, acolytes of the galaxy, back to our archives. It is now commonly known that Darth Sidious was more than a little disappointed that Anakin failed on Mustafar, resulting in him being bound to a suit of cybernetic armor that forever put a cap on his original, unfathomable powers. Years of plotting and planning for the future had literally gone up in flames right before Palpatine, and now he could only use Vader as a tool because of his cybernetic limbs and his newfound limitations. Despite this, however, what did Palpatine actually think about Anakin Skywalker's bionic arm? We know that Palpatine was absolutely furious at Obi-Wan for permanently crippling his long-awaited apprentice, but was he equally angry at Dooku for damaging his prize before his time was correct? Surprisingly, the answer is no. In fact, not only did Palpatine not mind Anakin's arm, he actually delighted in it. And today, we will answer why and open up yet another holocron and discuss why Darth Sidious actually loved Anakin Skywalker's mechanical arm. Before we dive in though, the Master of the Archives have reported that there are a few scholars pursuing our library who have not yet enrolled. If you'd like to be kept updated on what we post in our daily holocrons, then be sure to reach out and force crush that subscribe button to become an acolyte. Now, onto our holocron. Our source today comes from the Revenge of the Sith novelization, 
wherein we get an exclusive look at a private meeting between Count Dooku and Palpatine on the Invisible Hand. This chat takes place just minutes before Anakin and Obi-Wan rush in to save the Chancellor during the Battle of Coruscant. As the two conspire with one another about the plan that is going to take place, Dooku then begins to question Palpatine's decision to induct Anakin as his new apprentice. After criticizing Anakin's character, Dooku then makes a disparaging remark about his mechanical arm, to which Palpatine replies to the effect that if Dooku didn't like it, then perhaps he could have spared Anakin's real arm. And at this, Dooku says, a real gentleman would have learned to fight one-handed. After which, he launches into a tirade about how Anakin's mechanical arm basically made him subhuman in Dooku's eyes. Tyrannus remarks that the use of a biodroid device is almost forgivable as it was an upgrade from his original alien body, claiming that he was a disgusting creature to begin with. But like Anakin, the blend of droid and human was appalling, and Dooku goes as far to say that they shouldn't even associate with the young Skywalker. But Palpatine puts Dooku in his place, but very gently, responding with, how fortunate I am to have an apprentice that feels it appropriate to lecture me. Dooku backs down with a courteous apology, acknowledging that he stepped out of line. And then, Palpatine lays it all on the table plainly so that Dooku will now understand. The master then pauses and says this, Skywalker's arm makes him, for our purposes, even better. It is the permanent symbol of the sacrifice he has made in the name of peace and justice. It is a badge of heroism that he must publicly wear for the rest of his life. No one can ever look at him and doubt his honor, his courage, and his integrity. He is perfect, just as he is. He is perfect. This is certainly a very interesting explanation, with the obvious question being, why would Darth Sidious, a Sith Lord, care anything about things such as honor, peace, and integrity? The answer lies in subjugating the galaxy, the very topic that the two Sith were discussing. They needed to ensure that they had the trust of the common people of the Republic, and make it so that they could sway all public opinion against the Jedi, and this is something that we know. The very first step of this operation was getting Anakin to a place of fame in the public eye. Why was this so important? By using media outlets and the holonet, Palpatine ensured that Anakin's battlefield bravery made frontline pages every time. We don't get to see a lot of this on screen, but by the time of Revenge of the Sith, Anakin Skywalker was a household name, a true Jedi celebrity. Anakin was called the hero with no fear, and he was truly the Republic's protagonist in this war. If you saw a piece of the Republic propaganda, you could bet all your credits that it was going to feature Anakin Skywalker. And this was very meticulously done, and was all done on purpose, because Anakin was going to be the one to turn the public against the Jedi. You see, the mechanical arm, as Sidious pointed out, is his permanent badge of honor. It represents what he sacrificed for the Republic in the line of duty, proving that his heart belongs to the peace for all people. Palpatine was willing to sacrifice a little of Anakin's midichlorian count in his arm if it meant something much greater, the admiration of the Commonwealth. The original plan Sidious had in mind is much different than what actually played out in Revenge of the Sith. The original plan went like this. After Order 66 was finished, Anakin Skywalker would get on the holonet directly and broadcast a message all across the Republic using his great influence to denounce and antagonize the Jedi Order. With public support, it would be a very swift takeover and transition from Republic to Empire. To put it simply, Anakin's arm was a direct representation of his loyalty to the people of the Republic. And if you want to go even deeper, it wasn't just any wound, it was a lightsaber wound from a former Jedi. This would also go to show that Anakin was willing to go saber to saber for anyone on behalf of the Republic, even if it meant sacrificing his life. Of course, to the common citizen, they would see this and recognize that he would be willing to do this again, even if it were against his own Jedi brethren, for the betterment of the Republic, for the betterment of a lowly Republic citizen. This would for certain turn any galactic citizen against the Jedi beyond a shadow of a doubt. People like Palpatine as a politician well enough, but the Dark Lord wanted a true hero to be the face, or should I say, hand, of the new empire. Sidious's plan was brilliant, and even Dooku was forced to admit that this all made much more sense when he really was forced to think about it. The only things the two Sith Lord needed was to break Anakin out of the shell of his Jedi training, and for this, they simply needed Obi-Wan killed and to draw Anakin as deep to the dark side as they could. 
Dooku was to surrender after all of this following being defeated by Anakin, and after this, Dooku was to politely sit in prison and wait out the rest of the war, all while pretending to be remorseful and repentant of his rebellious ways. Once the Jedi were destroyed, Dooku would get a pardon and would come out of the Empire to help construct it. Palpatine had Dooku convinced that he would be the Emperor's right-hand man, while Anakin would serve as the general of a new Sith army. Dooku was going to remake the Jedi Order into something more powerful, and focused on the dark side with Anakin as his underling. However, Dooku was blinded by his ambition and his trust in Palpatine, as he never saw the betrayal coming. Rather than surrender, Dooku was executed at Palpatine's command, and the rest is history. Most ironic of all, Dooku would end up eating his words about Anakin's hand in the end, as both of his were taken just before his death to mark the true beginnings of Lord Vader. Unfortunately, along with Palpatine's plan for Anakin to become the most powerful Sith ever, his plan for Anakin to be the public face of the Empire also went up in flames on the shores of Mustafar. Vader was truly more machine now than man, and the public likely would have only seen him as another General Grievous, a fatal flaw, as the public would be thrown into a frenzy, handing one Force-sensitive regime to the other. This would cause mass revolution immediately, and would definitely threaten the Empire. And this is why the Emperor kept up his facade as a weak old man, and a reclusive old man behind closed doors. Darth Vader would instead become the face of the Imperial military, and he would fit that role with an iron fist. Sidious was also forced to obscure Darth Vader's identity as Anakin, with fear of those catching on that Anakin had fallen to the dark side, and become a tyrant like the old days. According to all Imperial public records, Anakin Skywalker was dead. But anyway, my friends, what are your thoughts on this and the fact that Darth Sidious actually loved Anakin Skywalker's biomechanical arm? And what do you think of Sidious's ultimate plan to raise Anakin as the true war hero of the Clone Wars, his great lie to Dooku, and why in the end, Darth Sidious proves his intelligence over nearly everybody? Welcome back, curious spacefarers of the galaxy. We were waiting for you. Since the inception, the Sith Order has had a vested interest in their homeworld of Korriban. This was of course the birthplace of the Sith themselves, both in the ways of the Sith pure-blooded race and when the Dark Jedi landed after the Second Great Schism to establish a brand new order. They of course would lose control over their ancestral homeworld following the Great Hyperspace War, when Naga Sadao would fail in his mission to take over the Republic, and in turn resulted in the Sith Empire being destroyed. Korriban would then change hands several times between the Republic and Sith for many thousands of years afterwards, until finally, the Rule of Two was established and we don't really hear anything about the precious Sith homeworld again. This is an exceptionally interesting fact considering that Darth Sidious made a hobby of his out of collecting Sith memorabilia. So why did he and Darth Vader just abandon Korriban altogether? Why is it that we don't hear them trying to go back to their homeworld and set up an operation there? Well my friends, we intend on answering this question today as we have found a couple of sources to suggest that there is more to this than meets the eye. Our first reason actually comes from all the way back in the days of Darth Bane in the Brotherhood of Darkness, in just the years prior to the creation of the Rule of Two. During this time, the Brotherhood of Darkness had established a base as well as an academy on Korriban, which was specifically meant to cultivate Sith Lords. This was the exact academy that Darth Bane would attend in the year's training in the Force. When he was a student towards the end of his studies, Bane had desired to venture into the Valley of the Dark Lords and try to find answers to the real meanings of the Sith homeworld amongst the other dead Lords, as well as discover what it truly meant to be a Dark Lord. The Sith Masters of the Academy tried to discourage this however, not only because delving into the ancient Sith might ruin Bane from the Brotherhood's ideology, but they had warned him that the Jedi had plundered the tombs of the ancients and stolen all of the dark side knowledge and artifacts that laid there. According to the Sith Masters, the Valley of the Dark Lords was nothing but a hollow shell of its former dark glory. Bane however, refused to accept this and decided to go on his own adventures only to be disappointed to find out that his Sith Masters had indeed been correct. Bane said that he sensed that the Valley of the Dark Lords only held a distant echo of the dark side, that the power that was once there had long been buried in the sands of time of the planet. The dark side was very strong on Korriban to be sure. The Masters even said that it ran through the planet like a lifeblood. However, this was mostly because of the people that continued to practice the dark arts on the world, and all of the dark side touched creatures that still roamed there, not due to the planet itself. A massive blow to the ancient Sith lineage. Whenever the Brotherhood of Darkness was destroyed during the Seventh Battle of Rusan, Darth Bane never bothered to go back to Korriban and just sort of left it there to rot, the sands of time continuing to take its toll. 
Who can hardly blame Bane, though? An examination of his history on the planet would make it understandable that he had likely left a bad taste in the Sith's mouth. Not to mention that Bane was not a sentimental man at all. If something or someone no longer held use to him, it was of no value any longer. This was the same attitude that he had for the homeworld of the Sith and Korriban. It was a distant memory of the dark side, and not to mention, a far too obvious hiding place. So what does this have to do with Vader and Sidious and the continuation of the Rule of Two? It was known for a long while amongst the Rule of Two generation of Sith that Korriban was more or less useless. One could take and go out on a large excavation if they so wanted to do so, especially considering Palpatine's resources following the rise of the Empire. However, these resources needed to go to another place altogether, as the primary goal of the Empire was the Death Star. No funding would go to any frivolous expenditures. The Empire cut costs everywhere, even at the expense of its own citizens most of the time. The military was the objective, so it wasn't like an archaeological dig on a forgotten planet was anywhere near the top of the list of priorities for that time. Palpatine now had access to a plethora of dark side rich worlds from which to spend his time, and if anything, his attention was mainly on the world of Dathomir. However, this wasn't the only thing keeping him from the Sith ancestral homeworld. It is actually quite possible that Sidious was somewhat spooked by it. But how do we know this? Well, in the Book of the Sith, we learn that Sidious once took a trip to Korriban, specifically to find ancient Sith spirits, in order to commune with them and learn their ancient secrets. He tells us this when he comments on Plagueis' skepticism that Sith spirits even existed in the first place. In the book, Sidious says this, The spirits of Korriban are quite real. Indeed, on one occasion, they nearly killed me, but I agree with my master in this observation. The dead Dark Lords are evasive in their speech, and are ultimately treacherous beings. What Sidious is saying here was that even if you could find a Sith spirit, it was a dangerous and nearly fruitless endeavor. It was unlikely that they would yield to you any real information and they could even possibly kill one of the greatest dark side wielders in all of the galaxy. Even Sidious, one of the most quintessential Sith in galactic history, was not privy to their knowledge. If any Sith Lord were to be worthy of the ancient secrets, it would be Sidious. And yet we know that one time when Sidious was mocked by the spirits of the Dark Lord such as Marka Ragnos, meaning that the standards of these ancient Sith Lords were impossibly high and, again, even Sidious was not deemed worthy of them. Sidious unfortunately doesn't go into any great detail about what happened on his visit to Korriban as well as with the spirits, but just that his very life was in danger and that he did indeed nearly die. I think it is a reasonable assumption to make from this statement that the Dark Lords were treacherous and that Korriban was not only a dead planet, but a haunted planet. What good would it be for the Empire to try and set up any sort of facility there if the mischievous Sith spirits were constantly interfering with its progress, driving the workers mad and sabotaging the equipment. Endless time and money would be sunk into the project in service of a goal that Sidious wasn't even sure existed anymore. With that said, were there possibly some important and powerful artifacts buried deep within the sand dunes of this ancient world? Perhaps, but it was far from definitive. Without the sure certainty of something hidden there with great power, there was just no sense in Sidious trying to endure the hauntings of the Sith ghosts, as well as risking his own life and resources. On the other hand, Darth Vader had absolutely no interest in chasing ghosts whatsoever. There are theories around to suggest that Vader might have visited Korriban at one point, but we know that he hadn't held a lot of interest for ancient Sith secrets unless they could provide a solution to an immediate problem. Chasing artifacts was his master's game. Though, we do know that the ancient Sith spirits in the Grand Tombs did have a throne fashioned for Darth Vader, an interesting piece of Star Wars lore. Perhaps they were even mocking Vader for what he could have become. Sidious would even discover this fact after his resurrection following the destruction of the Empire in Legends Continuity. In the comic book titled Empire's End, we can see Sidious's frustration with the spirits of Korriban on full display. When he desired to have healing for his damaged clone body, only to be refused and mocked by the spirits a second time. In conclusion, although the world permeated with the dark side, the Valley of the Dark Lords held nothing of use to any Sith trying to gain knowledge from the ancient tombs. Just old traps and curses with no reward light in wait for anyone desperate enough to cross it. Beyond this, Sith spirits were impossible to reason with, and for all of this, Sidious and Vader abandoned Korriban and never really tried to bother with it during their tenure in the Empire.
Darth Sidious, Emperor Palpatine, was without a doubt the culmination of the Rule of Two era. Darth Bane's original plan to hide for as long as it took while the Sith evolved and grew into power turned out to be a smashing success. After a thousand years of all of the Sith who had put their lives on the line in the legacy of the Baneite lineage, it paid off when Sidious was brought into the fold. Sidious would destroy the Jedi and establish rulership over the entire galaxy, exclusively controlled by the Sith. And it was here when Sidious ceased the Rule of Two, putting an end to it and beginning the plan that he had put in place ever since the beginning of his apprenticeship, the Rule of One. There are many of you wise scholars of the galaxy who would recognize this upon hearing it, yet may sense a discrepancy. Wasn't the Rule of One belonging to Darth Krayt almost 130 years after Sidious? Darth Krayt II would establish what is known as the Rule of One, and this would be the backbone of his order with all other Sith serving the one Dark Lord. However, Sidious's rule of one and Darth Krayt's one Sith are actually very different on a fundamental level. And in this holocron, we are going to talk about Sidious's rule of one, how it was much different from both the rule of two and Krayt's one Sith, as well as essentially why this was the grand plan of Darth Sidious and how he almost executed it perfectly. Darth Krayt's one Sith was an interesting take on the Sith organization. He followed the ancient ways of having one Dark Lord of the Sith and many underlings, but Krayt organized it far more effectively. Darth Krayt was a fiercely intelligent Dark Lord and ensured that the Sith were fanatically loyal to him under no uncertain circumstances. In the one Sith, the followers of Krayt were taught blind obedience and absolute loyalty to the Dark Lord. Instead of plotting and infighting of the previous Sith organizations, they were all devoted to him. Interestingly enough, they would actually take a page out of the Jedi Order's book on how they were structured. Sith Masters trained a single apprentice. However, after their training was completed, apprentices were required to slay their masters as a test of loyalty to Krayt. Masters who deemed their apprentices ready would allow themselves to be killed as long as it was on Darth Krayt's command. This allowed the Sith to reach massive numbers in their order without much threat to Krayt, despite what the holocron of Darth Bane had warned him of. There would come a time though when one of Krayt's underlings would betray and attempt to kill him, except Krayt had wisely prepared for this and managed to survive and get his revenge, placing himself firmly back on the mountaintop. In conclusion, the One Sith was basically a dark, warped mirror of the Jedi Order, appropriate since Krayt was a former Jedi. Except, of course, for the Sith, the Dark Lord would replace the Grand Master, and an inner circle would replace the High Council. Many Sith were under him, each with their own apprentices who all followed a micro version of the Rule of Two, but on a mass scale, with each apprentice under Krayt getting stronger than the previous Master. This made Krayt's order one of the most powerful in the history of the Sith. But what of Sidious? What was his rule of one? Well, Sidious's rule of one was fundamentally different. The one Sith was representative of the Sith order itself being one, meaning they were all united as one Sith under one Dark Lord. However, the rule of one meant there was literally only going to be a singular Sith Lord in existence. That being, of course, was Sidious. We find the meanings of the titles to be very intriguing, as the definition of the word rule changes when we go from two to one. There was the rule, meaning the law and the code of two, and then there was the rule, meaning the dominion or authority of the one. This is highly representative of exactly how Sidious planned to operate his new order. The plan of the Emperor was to essentially live forever using essence transfer or whatever dark side methods of immortality that he could reach, succeeding in what Darth and Dedu was too weak and paranoid to accomplish, which was to rule over the Sith eternally. However, Palpatine's approach to ensuring that he would not be betrayed and destroyed by his underlings was much different than all other Sith in the past. Earlier we stated that the rule of one by definition meant that there was only going to be a singular Sith in existence. Palpatine's plan was to basically train no other Sith whatsoever and establish himself as the final and only Sith in the galaxy. No more apprentices, no more successors, just Sidious. While this is not sound or sustainable, he had a plan put in place to train dark side acolytes, but only as cultists and followers, never true Sith. He would teach them all a mere fraction of his knowledge, so they'd be powerful enough to get stuff done, but nowhere near his level of mastery of the dark side. He would train many to serve as his hands, enforcers, and assassins to do his bidding, and when they became too powerful or a liability, he would betray and dispose of them. 
we can actually witness Darth Sidious testing out this philosophy using all of his underlings during the Clone Wars as guinea pigs. Maul would be the first test, trained as an apprentice. Sidious would tell him that he would accomplish great things, when in reality, Maul was merely an animal an assassin to be used for his purposes, and then discarded. Though his defeat at the hands of Kenobi was premature, Maul's days were still numbered, and when Maul returned, Sidious left no loose ends. And next you have Dooku, who believed he had a true place amongst the Sith forever, and yet he too was a pawn, a preeminent apprentice to the real prize of Skywalker. Dooku was very powerful, but easily manipulated, and there was someone far younger and more powerful and as long as there was, Dooku would always be expendable. Sidious allowed Dooku to have no amount of leverage over him, and when Sidious saw Ventress's power growing, he ensured that she was disposed of promptly. The only thing Dooku really had was Grievous, and Grievous was nothing to use against somebody like Sidious. Grievous was another animal like Maul, and nowhere close to a true threat. The point being though, Sidious is often criticized for quoting the rule of two but never actually adhering to it, as he had multiple assassins, apprentices, and hands, not to mention inquisitors. However, Sidious was more actually exchanging apprentices for more powerful tools so he could get his ultimate prize in Skywalker. The only real hole in Sidious's plan for the rule of one was Vader. In the end though, Vader was simply a tool as well, and just the final tool to the grand plan. Vader destroyed the Jedi Order, but then served as an enforcer as Sidious established the rule of one in the background. This is in fact one of the reasons why the Emperor was so displeased with Vader hunting Jedi. He needed Vader to help him run the Empire so that Sidious could go about his business and establish his own grand plan, which in the canon lore happened on Exegol. In the canon Vader comic, Vader finds all the cultists and things occurring on Exegol and confronts Sidious about it, realizing that Sidious was planning something big for the future, which likely did not include Vader. Now, while the Rule of One as it's named is technically a Legends continuity story, the main idea and framework for the Rule of One still exists within the Sith Eternal in canon, so we can pretty much rope those two together as being the same thing. But that, my friends, was Darth Sidious's plan and the Rule of One, and how it differed from Darth Krait's philosophy. In addition to this, our researchers have actually come up with a shocking theory pertaining to what Palpatine was really planning with Vader and Luke especially when it came time for the rule of one to be established. So if you'd like to hear our theory, then be sure to comment down below your thoughts on this holocron. There are very important and specific reasons about the Jedi that Mace Windu decided to face down Palpatine with and why he selected them. Reasons that he believed could combine to defeat Sidious. So, why did Mace Windu specifically choose Seisei Tin, Egan Kolar, and Kit Fisto to face down Sidious? Greetings again, students of the Force and acolytes of the galaxy. And if you haven't yet, reach out and force crush that subscribe button. It is your destiny. As soon as Windu learned that Chancellor Palpatine was a Sith Lord and the one that they had been looking for, he knew that there was no time to lose. He immediately got into contact with Yoda before assembling a task force of the strongest Jedi that he had on hand and immediately rushed off to arrest the Dark Lord. Little did any of them know what lay in front of them, for this mission would not turn out well. However, Mace Windu very rarely does anything by accident, and there was definitely a reason that he chose each of these specific Jedi Masters and left Shock T back at the Jedi Temple. So, my friends, for this holocron, we are going to go into the histories and skills of these three Jedi Masters, as well as the Revenge of the Sith novelization, in order to discover why Windu thought that they would be the best possible choices to destroy Sidious. And in addition to this, we are going to talk about each of these Masters' reactions when they learned too what the mission entailed. So, without further ado, let us begin. Each Jedi Master that Windu selected was first off renowned for their lightsaber skill, which is the largest reason for Windu's choices. As Kenobi stated, he believed that these four Masters were some of the best duelists the Jedi Order had at the time. But of course, we want to break down exactly what made each of their skills so legendary by looking at some of their feats. Let's begin with Kit Fisto. Master Fisto was one of the most popular Jedi of the Order, 
Trained originally as a consular, Vista was adept at manifesting the Force in powerful ways when in combat, inventing the Force Bubble, which was an underwater technique, as well as pioneering waterproofing lightsabers. The reason Windu placed him on this task force, though, was because he was a specialist in Form 1 lightsaber combat. Form 1 Shi Cho. Despite being the beginner form that was mostly taught to younglings, Fisto dedicated himself to mastering this form to the highest degree, which made him into an absolutely devastating combatant. When in the hands of a learner, Form 1 might be clumsy and cumbersome, with its wide arching, basic swings being somewhat predictable. But the way that Fisto had learned to master it turned it into a force of nature. Because the sequences were so simple, a master of the form could weave them together in complete random ways, making Shicho wild and completely unpredictable. Kit Fisto was a master of randomness, and his lightsaber wove itself around him with wild ferocity like a raging river. His exceptional use of the form earned him respect from even Dooku. Some that used the form even believed that it could lead to the dark side because of how aggressive it was. However, Kit Fisto fought with peace, always sporting his signature smile. One of the most impressive accomplishments of Kit Fisto was besting and nearly killing General Grievous in single combat, the only Jedi Master to do so besides Obi-Wan Kenobi. Despite this though, Fisto was anything but at peace when he realized that Palpatine was the Sith Lord that they needed to confront. While standing with the other two masters, Fisto was nervously rambling on about how he had a bad feeling and desired to wait for Master Yoda. He says this in the novel, I'd feel better if Yoda were here, or even Kenobi. On Ord Cestus, Obi-Wan and I, he would be unfortunately interrupted by the impatient Seisei Tin, who tried to snap him into reason by laying out all of the facts. But even after he did this, Kit Fisto insisted that he would still feel better if Yoda were there. It's interesting that Kit had such confidence in Obi-Wan, and he believed Kenobi's presence in their task force would actually make a difference in the mission. The account on Ord Cestus that Kit Fisto was interrupted, though, is when he and Kenobi managed to defeat Ventress and a couple of prototype Jedi killer droids, doing so by matching up their techniques and covering each other's backs. It was also that exact fight that Fisto had used for speed so adeptly that he was able to blur so fast that Kenobi could not see him. This speed would be his best friend during the confrontation with Sidious, as he was the last one of these three to go down at the hand of the Dark Lord, after deflecting several of his ferocious killing strikes. But speaking of Seisei Tin, we'll cover him now. Seisei was an Iktachi Jedi Master who was most well known around the Order for his excellent pilot skills, with some considering his level of skill to be the same as Anakin Skywalker. Of course though, these skills weren't what caught Windu's eye when he chose him to help take down the Chancellor, but likely his personality was. The Jedi Master was a man of few words, as he had an innate ability of telepathy. This allowed him to briefly see into the future and read minds even without the aid of the Force. But with the Force, his abilities were amplified. According to the novelization of Revenge of the Sith, the only reason Seisei died so quickly at the hands of Sidious was because he mistakenly dropped his guard while trying to read Palpatine's mind at the beginning of their fight. Seisei Tin was also a master of Form 5 Gem So. Seisei Tin was actually very similar personality-wise to Mace Windu, absolutely hating the dark side. In fact, he was one of the few Jedi that refused to forgive Master Quinlan Voss after he fell to the dark side, refusing to even call him by his name. It was Seisei's massive disdain for the dark side that made Windu select him, as well as his ability to read minds and combat prowess. Windu also believed the aggression of Form 5 could confront anything that Sidious threw at them. His reaction to the news are as follows. Kit Fisto expressed his concerns about the mission, and Seisei Tin would interrupt him. Yoda is pinned down on Kashyyyk, and Kenobi is out of contact on Utapau. The Dark Lord has revealed himself, and we dare not hesitate. Think not of if, Master Fisto. This duty has fallen on us, and we will suffice. Like Windu, Seisei Tin was ready to end the oppression of the Sith. And now, the final Jedi Master to cover is Aegon Kolar, the Zabrak Jedi. Interestingly, Kolar might be the most qualified master for this mission out of all of them besides Windu personally. Egan Kolar was blunt and unrelenting like a warsher tree on Kashyyyk. He never much cared for diplomatic niceties and was known for swift and decisive action. His idea of diplomacy was stand down or be put down. 
Egan Kolar was a master of unarmed combat and one of the best martial artists in the Order since that of Qui-Gon Jinn. He was known for taking down an entire mob of angry Cantina patrons without drawing upon his lightsaber even once. But should he ever draw his lightsaber, we would swiftly understand why Windu selected him to confront the Dark Lord. Perhaps besides Windu, he was the best with the blade, some calling him one of the greatest in galactic history even a master of form for Ataru, and was perceived to be second only to Yoda and rivaled by Kiadi Mundi with the form. Additionally, Egan Kolar was an adept master of form 5 as well, which often combined Jem So and Ataru swordplay in his fighting style, similar to the likes of Anakin. Kolar's proficiency with the lightsaber was such that the Jedi Council believed that Windu and Kolar alone would be enough to significantly counter Sidious, and that the rest of the Jedi were simply padding. In the minutes prior to their final mission, unlike the other two Jedi Masters with him, Kolar was at total peace. He said nothing the whole time, but calmed the worried Fisto and the impatient Tin by simply saying, Peace, Windu is coming. He was in a serious state of mind and had no time for reluctance or over-eagerness. He was completely center within himself and knew the Force was his ally, and in the end, it was a true shame that he had to be destroyed at the hand of Sidious. But anyway my friends and acolytes, has this explanation changed the way that you view these Jedi and this scene at all? What are your thoughts on all of these Jedi and why they were selected? And does it make Darth Sidious taking them out so quickly all the more terrifying?